over 25,000 people. Thank you, sir. I now request presence is very single, Karun. Chairman of Direct Access Trees, Udhir V. Yes. And uh, Sri Mohammed Dishad Garu, Chair of Jayeshwan and Customs Committee to the Dayas. By welcoming our Chief Guest, Sri Danda Srinivas Garu, and Guest of Honor, Rahul Sir. I now request our president and our chairmen to present plan to our chief guest and guest of honor. Thank you. I now request President of FTCCA, Sri Suresh Nimangagaru, to give welcome address. Good afternoon to all. It gives me an immense pleasure to extend my warm welcome to our chief guest, Sri Danda Srinivasi, IRS. Principal Commissioner of Income Tax for Hyderabad, Guest of Honor Sri Rahul Singhaniaji, IRS, Additional Commissioner of Income Tax, Range 9, Hyderabad, Speakers Venu, Venu Madhavi Ji, Mupala, Sri Amit Kumar Ji, Fitkariwal, Sri Mati Pallavi Pal, my colleagues, Sud CA Sudhir Ji, VS, Chair. Direct Access Committee FTCCI, CA, Mohammad Irshad Ahmed Ji, Chair, GST and Customs Committee FTCCI, Sri S. Srimalai Garu Ji, Advisor, GST and Customs Committee FTCCI. Distinguished Delegates, as you all are aware that Srimati Nirmala Sitaraman Ji, Finance Minister, Government of India, had presented Union Budget for the financial year 
2024-25 yesterday in the parliament. We all gathered here to discuss the various phases of the budget and what it entails for trade and industry in detail. Nirmala Sitaramanji presented her historic seventh budget in favor of farmers, youth, employment with skilling pro programs and financial support for industries under employment linked uh, incentives, energy sectors, especially solar renewal, renewable energy. FTCCI being industry association is happily welcome, welcoming the union budget, union government decision of encouraging and supporting MSMEs by new schemes and also creating new opportunities for startups, which in turn increase employment opportunities. It's encouraging to see that under, under urban development has been recognized as one of the key pillars of Vixit Bharat. The government initiative to support for highly education loans for 10 lakhs uh, to the youth and the and the push for women in the workforce is commendable. We can say the budget is mainly focused on employment, killing MSMEs, women, and the middle class. The experts who are present here today will explain in detail the implications of the proposed budget on economy, direct and indirect access. I am sure that the deliberations will be useful to the members. Thanking you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a question. This is in V.S. Varu, Chairman of Direct Access Committee, to give introductory remarks on direct tax proposal. Thank you, Rishmika, for this. Uh, delegates on the dais and off the dais, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I doesn't see the afternoon to be good for anybody. I don't know if it is the effect of the yesterday's budget. Right? So I think uh, there are a lot of positives also in the budget. We will be unveiling that in some time not today. So welcome all, welcome you all for this uh, discussion on the union budget. So the idea of to have this sort of a, a program is to actually analyze what are those fine prints uh, which has been changed uh, in the proposed to be changed in the budget. Uh, generally, the finance minister's speech gives you only a high level. So only when you actually read it, you get to know whether it is actually benefit, not benefit, and how it is going to affect your business. So in this attempt, uh, the FTCCI has done this uh, program of organizing and getting an expert uh, together. And uh, we are also very thankful that uh, the commissioner, sir, the principal commissioner of income tax uh, could uh, take out his time and uh, address us. So he will also give us some insights as to uh, what could be the background of few things which has been there. So yesterday when uh, uh, the finance minister, madam, presented the budget, uh, direct tax proposals was divided into three uh, aims. One was uh, simplifying, another is tax certainty, and third one is reduced litigation. So various uh, changes has been done in these three objectives, including reintroducing Viva's uh, Vishwas scheme and uh, various uh, other uh, 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 changes in the uh, uh, TDS or the capital gains taxes. So we will be diving deep into those uh, proposals and see what exactly it's going to impact us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now request C. Mohammed Iskad Garu, Chairman of Direct Tax GST and Customs Committee, to give introductory remarks on indirect tax proposals. Good afternoon, everybody. Respected Chief Guest of the program, Sri. Danda Srinivas Garu and guest of honor, Sri Rahul Singhania, President of 50 CCI, Sri Suraj Singhar, my colleague chairman, Via Sudhir, 
and my professional colleagues from KPMG and Deloitte, distinguished participants. So, Finance Minister yesterday in her budget speech, uh, when talking about the GST, of course, there are no proposals for GST in the speech, but there are law changes. But she has made some significant comments uh, while giving her speech. She claimed that <clears throat> the tax incidence on common man has come down post GST. And she also said the GST has reduced the compliance burden and logistical cost. And she also said it has paid them rich dividends, increased in revenue. We all agree that definitely GST has given them rich dividends for both the central and state. In so far as tax incidence is concerned, uh, she is also correct. Why? Because as we know, GST has bought, uh, eliminated the cascading effect of taxes. So we don't have any um, measure to quantify how much the rate has reduced, how much the incidence has reduced, but definitely it has uh, come down in the GST regime vis-a-vis -vis the sales tax and excise regime which was there prevalent prior to GST. But the compliance burden, as we all know, being the members of the industry and professional bodies, so uh, it is ever increasing and it is only multiplying and it is very hard for a small business person and even for big multinationals who are having heavy software tools to really comply with the GST law. So we have witnessed the show cause notices which were never witnessed thousands of crores of show cause notices which, which were issued in the GST law. So uh, finance minister also said that the GST law is going to further, they are going to further simplify the tax structure, although they have not commented anything as of now, but we have seen the GST council decisions from time to time that they are tinkering with the tax rate. We were hoping that the standard tax rate of 18% uh, would come down somewhere in the middle, but that has not come down. Maybe. Uh, her hinting of rationalization of tax structure may be in that direction. And another significant comment is that they are going to bring within its fold many other sectors into the GST law. I am seeing this as hint towards bringing in petroleum and diesel and also the electricity into the GST fold. Of course, alcohol may not come. In fact, they have made the changes in, GS in Section 9 to bring um, another item which is used for alcohol. So alcohol will be outside the purview of the GST, but definitely petroleum and uh, diesel and electricity may come into the fold of the GST in coming days. That is what I feel. So insofar as customs are concerned, of course, the customers are viewing this as benefit to them. But really the intention behind reducing the basic customs duties are <clears throat> to support the domestic manufacturing. Because when you reduce the input cost, the duties on input. So uh, it will reduce the cost of manufacturing. It will encourage people to manufacture import and manufacture domestically. And she also said to, uh, to uh, push for local value addition. So keeping this perspective in mind, they have reduced the rate on jewelry as well. They have bought down from 10 to 6% so that they don't manufacture jewelry in Dubai, but they're manufacturing jewelry in India. So uh, similar such changes were proposed in the budget to support the domestic manufacturing. And when uh, the finance bill was published and when we saw the amendments, there is uh, some sort of disappointment, uh, if I may say, and I think Amit is going to talk in detail on that, but a couple of points which I would like to put, put forth and we may also have to represent on that. Uh, 74, which is a show cause notice uh, demand section that has been overhauled and they have clarified now that even in the monthly return, if there is a delay of payment of taxes in monthly return, so a delay of about 30 days, then there would be a penalty of 10% or 10,000 rupees, whichever is higher. So if I have a tax payable of, let's say, 1,000 rupees in any month, and if it gets delayed by about 30 days, so I will end up paying penalty of 10,000 rupees for a tax of um, yeah, one one hundred rupees or ten thousand, whichever is higher, ten thousand rupees for the tax. So this we have to strongly protest. In previous section, that this clarity was not there, but now they have come out very openly. So uh, this has to be definitely represented, and they should really consider this. And they have also notified sections on 
uh, input tax credit allowing for input tax credit for november up to november 2020 21 but we would have really wished for giving the amnesty because they have also clarified the taxpayers who have already reversed the itc they are not going to get the benefit because we are now in 2024 and numerous notices were issued and many businesses have already reversed the itc they are not going to get this advantage isn't it so therefore uh, rather they if they want to give the real benefit they would have, of course there are businesses they will who will also benefit so but uh, those those businesses who have already reversed in fact they are far better than people who have, who have not paid they should also get the benefit this is what we feel so with this small note i think uh, in gst session you are going to hear more about this and uh, we welcome you sir and with this note i congratulate everyone of you for having being here and thank you so much thank you sir i now request timothy t sujatha our senior director of ftcc to introduce our chief guest and guest of honor to the gallery thank you lakshmika uh, my privilege to introduce uh, the most esteemed guest sri srinivas danda garu the chief guest and also sri rahul singhania garu the guest of honor for today's session uh, sri srinivas danda he an irs officer of 1992 batch presently he is uh, posted as principal commissioner of income tax for at hyderabad the officer has worked in various capacities as assistant commissioner of income tax deputy commissioner of income tax joint commissioner of income tax additional commissioner of income tax commissioner of income tax and principal commissioner of income tax in various parts of the country such as chennai bangalore new delhi and hyderabad apart from that mr sinivas danda has worked earlier on deputation as director in cbdt and as a joint secretary in government of india considering the various postings and deputation both within the cadre and outside the cadre over the period of 32 years in service mr srinivas danda has varied exposures in not only administration of the income tax act but also at a policy making level we welcome you sir and request you to please address the participants uh, before that i would like to also introduce uh, sri rahul singhania garu he is an again irs officer of 2011 batch presently he is posted as additional commissioner of income tax in range 9 at hyderabad by qualification he is chartered accountant cost accountant company secretary and llb sir has not left anything before his posting at hyderabad he was posted at mumbai and there he worked in the investigation wing international taxation and corporate and non corporate assessment charges he also worked in the enforcement directorate as a deputy director at hyderabad for 3 years from 2022 to 23 before joining the indian revenue service he worked in finance and taxation department of ms ongc limited for 5 years and uh, during his tenure in ongc he joined the territorial army raised by the government of india for the oil sector and he was commissioned as lieutenant in the territorial army so that's a very rich and varied experiences you have thank you for gracing the occasion uh, now i invite uh, sri srinivas garu to address the gathering um uh, mr singhal this is working this is not working um uh, at the outset uh, thank you for having me over mr singhal i am uh, deputizing for my boss the principal chief commissioner ap and telangana mrs uh, mitali madhuspita she is traveling on official work so uh, she has asked me to deputize for her so from uh, yesterday we have all been seeing i am sorry i forgot to greet the other distinguished members on the dais Mr. Ashal and Mr. Sanjay Sudhi. Yes, and of course, Mr. Rahul Singhania is my own additional commissioner, so highly qualified young man. So you have all been seeing television. There are a lot of young people here for the last three days. The pre-budget economic survey, as we all know, is a. Uh, it's been, in fact, it's been. It's it shows the country's resilience. If you look at it, 
we have been through a lot over the last few years covid recovery all these things india it's uh, we are still trying we are maintaining steady growth despite uh, so many global uncertainties wars and the survey co- covers a large number of sectors whether it's agriculture industry services social welfare and also emphasizing the importance of sustainable development financial stability and inclusive growth we have a stable economic growth trajectory with a gdp growth rate of about 6.5 to 7% achieved through very balanced sectorial growths given the circumstances globally i will keep repeating that verb given the circumstances globally and this is against this is a very conservative figure i would say professionally when especially since imf has forecast indicated 7% asian development bank has indicated about 7% SBI research has indicated about eight uh, percent again. This is all been public domain. I'm not sharing any anything confidential. And then if we look at the pre-budget economic survey, because I'll I'll deal with it in in uh, three or four uh, phases. Because for the technical session, there are very good lead speakers both for direct and indirect access. So I'll just talk from a general macro perspective. then we have seen how the financial sector is also monetary management and financial intermediary stability is been the watchword the financial sector has demonstrated very robust growth with improvements in asset quality as we can see in the nps coming down of banks increased uh, credit growth and significant strides in financial inclusion then uh, prices and inflation effective monetary policies by the rbi and strategic measures have kept retail inflation manageable at 5.4% with specific efforts to stabilize food prices it's expected to be moderate at around 4.5% going forward the external sector has displayed stability with a reduced trade deficit and an improved current account balance due to a strong services exports and lower global economic commodity prices the medium term outlook a gdp growth rate of about 7.8 to 7% driven by infrastructure investments digital economy expansion and improvements in the ease of doing business are all again very strong positives going forward and then uh, as we know in a very important uh, place is the uh, energy sphere india is committed to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2070 and significantly reducing over a period of the next 10 20 years balancing its development goals with the environmental sustainability and focusing on a low carbon development pathway again uh, social sector benefits that empower increased investments in healthcare education social security aimed at improving the lot of citizens enhanced overall well being and promoting inclusive growth then employment and skill development towards quality focusing on creating quality jobs promoting entrepreneurship and aligning skills with market demands to improve youth employ- employability and drive economic growth agriculture and food management we are moving towards an era of self reliance and resilience then uh, there is a reasonably good industrial growth supported by increased uh, infrastructure investments and promotion of domestic manufacturing under the make in india initiative the services sector has been something very amazing a lot of young professionals here they'll know the services sector led by it telecommunications financial services has remained a major growth engine with notable revival in tourism and significant contributions from digital services fiscal developments ma- maintaining the balance efficient revenue growth and public expenditure management helped reduce the fiscal deficit within the targeted range reduce public debt and ensure sustainable fiscal health 
and an important last part which the economic survey deals with is climate change in india why we must look at the problem through our lens advocating for a unique approach of climate change that balances economic development with sustainability emphasizing solutions tailored to india's specific needs and developmental goals then there are certain key features now i'll switch on to the budget key features of the union budget this again we all have been keeping a track of it in various forums since last afternoon i would like to just take a few key key areas as the previous uh, speaker mr singhal has pointed out the focus has been on four major target groups one is the garib the poor women mahila yuva youth and anadata the farmer the budget themes have been employment skilling micro small and medium enterprises msmes and middle class then the priorities for viksit bharat which is developed india productivity and resilience in agriculture pardon viksit a uh, 2047 viksit bharat this is the period of amrit kal the 25 years running up to it uh, transforming agricultural research national cooperation policy atmanirbhara for oil seed such as mustard groundnut sesame soya bean and sunflower natural farming stem production and export digital public infrastructure then uh, employment and skilling inclusive human resource development and social justice manufacturing and services urban development energy sector infrastructure irrigation and flood mitigation tourism innovation research and development and the next generation reforms which are very critical area going forward they talk of rural and uh, urban land related actions taxonomy for climate change fdi and overseas investments nps vatsalya which is for parents to invent uh, invest for their minor children for the children for minors improvement of data governance etc and the new pension scheme Now I'll digress a bit. Today we are all late. I apologize to the chair because today is a very important day for us being in the income tax departments. My additional commissioners, joint commissioners are here. Today is the we are celebrating the one sixty fifth income tax day. Uh, this was started uh, just for a little bit of historical context uh, may i know how many have heard there about today's income tax day yes uh, very few i'll just uh, one 165th income tax day income tax day was started in uh, 1860 by a britisher called james william uh, wilson he started it and uh, with it was basically a colonial tax at that point of time it was basically to rebuild uh, the british india thing uh, after the great sepoy mutiny of 1857 but it has evolved over a period of time tremendously today we are all all of us are stakeholders not just the department officers or officials but also everyone here is a stakeholder because we are contributing 36% of each rupee comes from indirect personal income tax and uh, corporate tax and this has become a vital tool for nation building anything any rupee going out whether it is for defense or education or health or infrastructure goes out of that so this day celebrates our role in nation building ensuring financial equity and social justice through our efforts we, are, we enable the government to fund vital infrastructure social welfare programs defense development initiatives thereby contributing directly to the nation's growth stories our responsibilities have expanded alongside the growth of our economy necessitating agility and innovation in our approaches to taxation uh, i'll just give a small uh, a personal example when i joined service in the early 90s the focus was uh, on a more adversarial and uh, uh, enforcement approach 
uh, from there the move it started moving over a period of time it's more taxpayer approach taxpayer service and transparency as the honorable fm was repeatedly saying yesterday and distinguished uh, fellow speakers will know about it once they, we go into the technical sessions we are having now everything is out in public in the, in the domain of the taxpayer if we uh, log into our annual information ais or our 26 as we can see what we have to file we don't have to take any make any uh, herculean effort filing of uh, returns is not a very complicated exercise. i'm talking about direct taxes i don't know much about indirect taxes we, so it's become a much easier exercise it used to be how many i would like to know if there were anyone who was filing returns uh, as practitioners prior to 2007-8 any senior practitioner ernst and young llb so many are here it used to be a herculean task you have to collect all your documentations put it through it now you don't need ha huh? there's only one hand so it used uh, it used to be a very herculean task then it must have been more herculean to today it is much more easier we all know it uh, we all know it and we don't need uh, anyone to guide us literally if software engineer to anyone can file it that that is the reason why uh, we are doing in fact i'll digress a little bit since we are on income tax day but i will be talking with the mr singhal on the sidelines once we finish because we are doing massive outreaches <laughs> the for uh, the the proper filing of returns and bogus refund claims which we are coming across or wrong refund claims uh, which has become some some sort of i won't call it a menace but it's unfortunately happening i would request people you are all to take it up with your individual taxpayers to kindly file the returns correctly because they get into a lot of trouble i see it because i have a salary range the joint commissioner is right here we we are going into a different level where we, it will attract penalties prosecution all that is not needed if you just look at our uh, ais and our 26 as it all in fact the technical speaker i'm sure will go into this area also so that is the reason why i was late for this and it was uh, there was a nice address by our chairman cbdt mr ravi agarwal which was also played out that was uh, emphasizing the fact that we have become non adversarial we are saying please come play your taxes file smile and go and i am firmly of the considered view that bulk of the people want to pay their taxes and go nobody wants to waste their time or get into a protracted engagement with the the department whether it's direct taxes or indirect taxes because they have to file their return and go ahead then uh, we'll just talk i'll talk in a very general way about the tax proposals we have broken it up into four uh, different uh, spheres one is review of the income tax act next is simplification of charities and tds litigation and appeal and deepening and widening of tax bases there are over 80 sections which have undergone a change in the uh, in the statute income tax statute i think uh, they will be taking it up after this session first is the review of the income tax act so this is also a very landmark thing which has been proposed and uh, ve very much needed because even we sitting on this side of the table we also feel it after uh, 32 years in service also every every second i have to keep referring to the statute and we find that there it's uh, it's technical so we are this effort being made by the government which is i think a six month time frame rahul yeah. six month time frame will hopefully throw up i'm sure they'll ask for suggestions from all the chambers and everyone as for cham fiki of course here so that uh, it becomes much more easier an exercise and much more uh, streamlined and easier for all of us this will also reduce litigations very importantly we are seeing a huge number of litigations uh, uh, going on and on and 
I have been a CIT appeals for about six to seven years in Hyderabad. The litigations are only increasing now because whatever be the reason, they are only increasing. I'm sure a review of this will throw up all these things coming forward. It will provide uh, tax certainty to taxpayers. It will also bring down the amount of demand embroiled in litigation and the process, if it is six months, we can all expect things to happen. A very important scheme which has been announced is Direct Tax Vivaat Se Vishwa Scheme 2024. It's been the endeavor of the ministry consistently to, to provide expeditious disposal of appeal over a period of time. For instance, the institution of additional CIT or JCIT appeals has been introduced. Then you have a disputes resolution some uh, committee which has been set up and then the targets for appeal commissioners i was doing only about 400 appeals now i'm told it's become 500 and i may go up further also 600 and uh, th that becomes uh, significantly high and uh, one such measure which will really help in disposing these appeals is uh, the direct tax vivat savishwa scheme uh, 2024 the contours Specifics, I'm sure, will come in due course uh, because this is similar to what was launched in 2020. The, uh, the scheme that time got an extremely positive uh, response and also resulted in both. It was a win win situation. The taxpayer won because he could finish off his litigation and carry on with his business or profession, and for the government because it was earning revenue. It was earning for revenues. And keeping in view the success of the previous uh, Vivat Se Vishwa scheme 2020 and the mounting pendency of appeals, this introduction of the scheme is proposed with the objective of providing a mechanism of settlement of disputed taxes, etc., by reducing litigation without too much cost to the exchequer. And even for the associate, it becomes easier because he can sort out all a whole lot of issues. The date of the scheme will be notified, as you could see from the literature, will be notified by the government in due course of time. Another very significant area is simplification of registration of charitable trusts or funds or institutions. The two tax regimes for charitable trusts are proposed to be merged into one. The merger of trusts under the first regime with second regime. The Act puts in place the two main regimes for trusts or funds or institutions to claim exemptions. The first is, con is contained in the provisions of subclauses of section 1023C. The second is contained in the provisions of 31 section in uh, sections 11 and 13 of the Act. The provisions of the respective regimes laid down the procedure for filing of appeal for approval, registration, the conditions subject to for which such approval stroke registration can be granted or withdrawn. As both the regimes intend to grant similar benefit, the procedure and conditions across the two regimes have been aligned over the last few years by successive Finance Act. In order to take forward the process of simplification of procedures and to reduce administrative burden, it is proposed that the first regime be sunset and trust funds or institutions be transited to the second regime in a gradual way. Hence, these, these, these will come in from 1st October 24 and there are a large number of things uh, which are very micro detailing which we can take it up in the technical session. Then simplification of TDS. TDS is TDS, but TDS is needed. There is a senior of mine, you may be knowing him, he retired as member of CBDT, he was a principal chief commissioner, one Mr. Sanjay, Sanjay Kumar Varma. He wrote a landmark book, TDS is TDS in the 90s. The 5% TDS rate on many payments is being merged into 2% TDS rate and the 20% TDS on repurchase of units by mutual funds or UTI is being withdrawn. The TDS on e-commerce operators is produced to be proposed to be reduced from 1 to 0.01%.
then there's also decriminalizing delay for payment of tds up to the due date of filing of the statement for uh, the same so this is under section 276b which provided for prosecution in case of failure to pay tax to the central government as per under chapter 12 or 14 this it is supposed to amend this particular section to provide for exemption from prosecution to a person covered under clause A of the section if the payment of tax deducted in respect of the quarter has been paid to the credit of the central government at any time on or before the prescribed time for filing the statement. And there will be a standard operating procedure which will come out for TDS defaults and simplify and rationalize the compounding guidelines for such defaults. Then there is a immunity to Benamidat in Benami Prohibition Transaction Act. I would request uh, Rahul to deal with this when, when you are going to take up this, this specific because he's also worked in Enforcement Directorate. So he should be able to give a perspective on this as to how exactly, what exactly the changes. And the corporate tax on foreign companies has been also reduced. There are large number of details which, again, if I keep repeating, you'll be, I'll be going into the technical sessions. Then uh, there's another very important thing is the holistic picture. When we look at the thing, you can please, uh, the previous speaker was talking about certain difficulties in the uh, on the indirect tax side, which again, I plead ignorance because we deal with the direct taxes. Uh, over a period of time, when uh, things were really complicated to a time when things are getting simpler and simpler we may be facing uh, some amount of technical glitches which has also been a thing of the past some amount of difficulty but that that is also getting simplified for instance when e-filing of returns i'm talking digressing again a bit when e-filing of returns was introduced in about 2007 or 8 it was very difficult. Similarly here, when faceless was introduced, and it's going very well right now, there have been certain glitches and difficulties, but that is also getting smoothened out. And similarly, we have even in the appeal side, uh, we are ha having a backlog of appeals, no doubt about it, but they are also getting streamlined. And with this Vivatsa Vishwas coming in, it will again take out a whole lot of uh, burden. So. Things are being factored in, for instance, the suggestions which they have given. We got a, a large number of suggestions from the Chamber of Commerce. So even those, those are what suggestions you give have been similar suggestions, I understand, have been given by Asocham, Fiki, in uh, Delhi level, and uh, Chambers of Commerce. They may be about rectification. I think it came from your direct tax committee. <laughs> then there are some about Stay matters, for instance. So, high, high yeah, high beach matters. These sort of things, these are already being factored in. It's factored in at macro levels, at a very, very macro level. It's This is all what we could say is work in progress, much like many other places. And it's at multiple levels. And uh, the budget has just been announced. Session goes on till 12th. They factor into account many of these. So with this, I would like to conclude. I would like to give space to my colleague, Mr. Rahul Singhania, to go into the nitty gritty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now request our guest of honor, Arsenal Commissioner of Income Tax Range 9, Mr. Rahul Singhania Garu, to address the gathering. Respected dignitaries sitting on the dais, respected speakers, dear participants, a very good afternoon to all. The Federation has shared with us a list of uh, suggestions, challenges, and issues faced by them. Uh, the list contains 12 items. One item is related to amendment in the Act, one item is related to issuing the circular by civility, and 10 items are related to problems faced by the tax practitioner in day-to-day, -day, they're working. 
first two item needs little deliberation so i'll be speaking little more on this two aspect and rest 10 of the items we can go through first issue raised by the federation related to the taxation under section 115 bbe at the rate of uh, uh, 60% plus uh, surcharge of 25% and then a payment of penalty of 10% so it has been suggested that this tax rate should be reduced before going uh, i think this suggestion is welcome suggestion and this can be uh, shared with the severity but uh, i need little more justification for this suggestion which is well uh, federation can share with us subsequently and if we see the background of this section 115 bbe this came into the backdrop of the demonetization after demonetization government of india launched a scheme called pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana option was given that uh, you pay the taxes 30% plus uh, uh, some penalty and make a deposit things are over and in the same scheme it was mentioned that that scheme was valid up to 31st december 2017 in the same the this brought by the tax amend the tax amendment the second tax amendment act 19 uh, to, uh, 2016 in the same scheme it was mentioned that uh, after 14 2017 the tax would be payable at 77.25% 77.5% under 115 bbe so this provision was introduced to discourage the dishonest tax payer a exit scheme exit option was given to the uh, tax payers whosoever has paid the money into their bank account in view of the demonetization and even if the scheme if the person is not have not availed the garib kalyan yojana scheme then this provision was this 77.5% tax was uh, leviable on the, under 115b was introduced so i think uh, in this background if federation share some more suggestion some more justification i will say ki why this provision should be removed definitely we, it can be shared with the higher authorities to be taken up either in this uh, uh, next uh, overall overalling of this income tax act itself so this was a uh, first technical thing second technical point was shared with us to issue a circular with respect to explanation 2a to section 9 section 91 this section 91 is with respect is related to the income deemed to accrue or arise in india and this explanation 2a was in, uh, introduced by wide finance bill 2020 applicable with effect from 1st april 2022 if i tell you the background of this provision it was against the fragmentation of profit certain entities were fragmenting their business activity the example of fragmentation is like a company uh, obviously it is with respect to non resident foreign company they were fragmenting their business activity like they were doing in india the activity activity of storage and delivery and then the stand was taken ki no since we are doing only the storage and delivery activity so this is not a business activity and tax is not payable so in that backdrop this explanation was introduced <coughs> it was a uh, it was defined that uh, significant economic presence scp that con that concept was already there and then this provision or this clarification or explanation was introduced that whatever activity you do if the quantum exceeds 2 crore you have to pay the tax with respect to attributable to that business activity only so again my my opinion is, is that if this was a, a welcome explanation inserted and this was inserted in compliance of mli mli this this was all this activity was resulting into the profit uh, profit shifting base erosion and this problem was 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 not with india it was across the world the mncs were every in every country they were having only a fragmented business activity and they were paying taxes nowhere 
So in, in every country, they have a small business activity that does not constitute the taxable income in under the act uh, of that particular country. So he is not paying the taxes, and he prof, all the profit are being shifted to the countries where the tax uh, there is low tax or there is no tax. So in that gap, that uh, OECD uh, G20 OECD project was taken up, and this MLI was, came into existence. India also India was also the signatory of the MLI tax treaty, and then with effect from uh, 2022 to curb the problem of this base uh, B uh, B S P base erosion and profit shifting, then uh, this provision was introduced. With this background, I request that if still there is any more suggestion, uh, we can take it take it up with the CBDT. So these were the two technical things I wanted to discuss. The rest other things are the issues related to the tax practitioners and tax uh, uh, payers, obviously, in they are facing in their day-to-day -day life. First issue is related to the disposal of Section 154 rectification application. So the uh, challenges or the issues which I have been shared, we have been shared that these applications are uh, being disposed of by the CPC in a routine manner. It's not a detailed order. And even some, in some cases, applications are uh, disposed of within hours. This issue is well accepted, appreciated. And uh, this issue will definitely brought to the notice of the CPC if they are passing the, wherever they are passing the order. The CPC and the JAO will be apprised of the issue and they will be advised to pass the speaking order while disposing of the rectification application. Second issue was uh, raised, uh, fourth issue was raised regarding the high pitch assessment. And then it is uh, informed uh, the problem. Uh, it is said that sometimes the assessment is like uh, 10 times to 100 times of the re returned income. And uh, we are still, uh, even if the complaint made, made to the high pitch committee, things are not moving. In this regard, I'll say ki, if there is a high pitch assessment, please uh, file a stay petition. In, in all genuine cases, demand is being stayed. And, uh, and whenever, it's my personal opinion, since I being uh, uh, like, uh, I sat on the both sides of the table. So <laughs> I'll say, whenever a notice is issued, please reply. Only then the AO will come to know that uh, uh, there is some petition pending with the uh, principal CIT or some other authorities. I, another issue raised by the time granted for the, uh, the very less time is, time is granted for the adjournment. Normally they ask for 15 days, CIT appeal gives or AO gives five days, four days, seven days like that. This issue is also, uh, we, we will definitely take up the issue and we will inform to the authorities, JAO and CIT appeal to take care of this. From department point of view, I'll say that uh, uh, this adjournment should not be taken in a routine manner. I mean, most of the time, I, when I was CA, I was doing the same thing. So <laughs> I suggest that whenever you uh, seek adjournment, at least furnish some partial reply, and then to seek the adjournment. Blanket adjournment, keep again and again, also irritates the assessing officer. So that can be, uh, it's a two-way traffic. It can be improved both ways. Another issue is a lengthy questionnaire. Uh, definitely, sometime it is there. We we agree. So this issue will again be taken up. Will whosoever the assessing officer, they will be informed and sensitized. Another issue is a repeated submission of the same data to the department. I agree that this is a problem that some many times department keep on asking for the same thing. We accept, and this issue will be also be taken up. Another problem was adjustment of refunds against the earlier year demand. Uh, here I feel that uh, if the, there is a demand, you please take a stay. And in genuine cases, the stay will be granted. And the uh, refund will be adjusted only when there is no stay. Because 245 is a uh, uh, 245 net notice is issued many times, there is no response at all. Or even if there is a response, the response is so like complicated that you can't make out what, what the SSC wants to convey. So it's a, like a, trying to confuse the thing. Until there is a, if there is a demand, obtain the stay. If there is a stay, there will be no, no adjustment, no 
I mean, it is just so simple. So, <laughs> one issue is a case of non-resident and cases involve LRs. That in case of non-resident, that that issue is valid issue. That in case of non-resident department, Suomoto allots the pain, uh, pan, and then completes the assessment. But the things are not smooth enough. We ex uh, we have uh, we will be raising this issue with the DGIT system to smoothen the this process. Tenth issue is delay in delay of communication after case is completed. This is again a technical things uh, like uh, the things are uploaded, the notices or assessment orders are uploaded, and then it is um, available for display to the SSC. DGIT system will be taken into uh, will be informed to take up this thing. Uh, this is a case of a uh, second last issue is related to the deceased. In case of deceased uh, SSE, the legal representative, uh, they are not able to get the refund. I also have written that more information is required. Actually, even I couldn't make out what kind of difficulty they are facing because otherwise there is no point just accepting the suggestion or accepting the uh, receiving the challenges and then doing nothing. So if you uh, convey that what exactly is uh, what sort of problem is faced, we will definitely take up. Last one is related to the expeditious faceless assessment. This issue has already been taken up, taken care by the Madam FM yesterday. He has introduced, he announced that more uh, appellate units will be set up. So I think out of 11, 12 issues, this issue is taken care. Rest of the issue will, whatever the possible, we take care, uh, we'll definitely raise the level and uh, give it to the level, uh, reach, make it reach to the level of severity and then it will go to his, uh, uh, this conclusion, logical conclusion. Regarding PCIT, sir, uh, told that one issue of Benami Dar. This is a pretty uh, like a simple thing that now the department has made this issue, but Benami, earlier Benami Dar was also equally uh, culprit. <coughs> But so when the Benami Dar is the person, like uh, I just example if uh, I am the person, I am the beneficiary, uh, beneficial owner, and I took some property in the in the name of my my driver. So driver is Benami Dar, and driver was also made the equal culprit. This is a uh, criminal investigation, criminal case is filed, criminal prosecution is filed. So those person, even driver was not also coming forward. To give the evidence, so even in those cases, the uh, beneficial owner like me, I will also got a scot free. So now the changes has been made that Benamidar will not be, uh, he will not be in the, on the same footing as the beneficial owner. Benamidar will get the immunity if he discloses everything. With uh, it's a full disclosure. The word is a full disclosure. So and but at the same time, if the full disclosure turns out to be false, not the full disclosure, he will again put in the same pedestal. So this was a change made in the this uh, Benami Act. With this, I'll conclude my uh, speech. Thank you so much for the patient here. Before starting technical session, uh, we will have a presentation of momentos to our chief guest. Before that, I want to. There is one, no, not two. Uh, <laughs> sir, uh, you have pointed out that litigants. Uh, gone up. Yes. But you should understand, we, in our opinion, the officers are government are more litigant. I can tell you, we are the we are the taxpayers. We are legitimate taxpayers and the officers are suspecting the uh, honest uh, taxpayer, they should not uh, suspect them. And if at all, anything is there, you are issuing notices and they are coming to you. But the, again, the notices are not finalized in a time frame. 
why they are pull, you are pulling on for years together why they should approach the high court court supreme court why the chance to be given why it is not uh, completed at your uh, level and uh, unnecessarily they have to they have to spend so much money in going to the court and all so that has to be looked into it is our humble request from our side sir so can we see don't suspect the legitimate and the honest tax payer there are i don't say there are people who are dishonest also that kind of them put whatever penalties you want to put but that honest tax payer should not be put into a problem where they are not able to go to high court or supreme court why they should waste their money for just paying uh, and uh, waiting and after that suppose 10 years or 20 years or 15 years or 5 years it is dragged down in the court they have to put uh, interest on that how will it be able to pay interest so much it is piling up so can we look into this also uh, it's a humble request thank you Uh, thank you for this. So, uh, we are sensitized to this. It's not that uh, we, which factored into account, and the transition is happening over a period of time. I said from a non-adversarial, we are moving into an era. There will, there may be some uh, rough areas or glitches which we are overcoming. I pointed out uh, we are overcoming the same, and there there is a certain enforcement angle that that is a separate issue. And uh, by and large, we are more into voluntary compliance. i guess uh, 99.99% is voluntary compliance and m- m- most of us are tax payers i don't think we would have got a return or something where we have we come across cases where people are not for instance we have cases where there huge deposits made in the bank accounts and they are not filing returns so so this is the, we are sitting on the other side so we we see the other side so which is all uh, those kind of yeah we we have no <laughs> It is best that we are after them. We can't discuss that. Uh, <laughs> you see, but we have come across these sort of cases. It's not that. So I wanted to just uh, talk a bit about uh, I, uh, this tax collection through coercion. You can rest assured that there cannot be tax collection through coercion. Nobody can attach your accounts so easily. And attachment under two twenty six three requires approval of a commissioner or principal commissioner. And I, as a serving officer. to exercise these powers it's not that we blindly sanction it we don't blindly sanction and this thing and this 20% demand also you please go on a stay before the principal commissioner or before the relevant authorities and it's uh, these are looked at very judiciously so it's it, it may be in many cases we may not be able to help because some cases they are absolutely not filing returns so there different uh, different things uh, which yeah. we have to factor into account Where there is voluntary cooperation, so we are the first. We are happiest because it reduces the cost of collection. There is hardly any cost. The cost of tax collection is falling over the years. Thank you. Thank you. I want to just tell the rules and regulations and the act in the act itself. The meaning the assessee takes in different ways. And the officer takes in that other way. This interpretation of the rule, so the benefit of doubt, benefit of the doubt should be given to the assessee. That is our right. Now, the commissioner has come to the conclusion that the government, the material taken through on 17th of July, as a usual, we have played our. I mean, we have filed our return. Around three thirty, four o'clock. At seven thirty, eight o'clock, we are receiving the refund. So it's really a treatment for the uh, general public. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I also recognize the presence of Sri Mila Jaya Garu, immediate past president, and Tirumala Garu to join the presentation.
I request the speakers uh, to come on the day of the group photo. Yeah, Vodu Vavu Madam, Amit Kumar sir, and uh, Palavi. Please come on to the day. Yeah, I now request uh, speakers of today's session. Srimati Venu Madhavi Mupala, partner at Ernest and NLP. Sri Amit Kumar, partner at Deloitte India, Private Limited. Srimati Pallavi Paul, technical director at BSR and Co. LLP to come on to the desk. I also request both shows uh, to present plans to the speakers. And welcome. Yes, yes sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, present uh, plans to Venomago University. Uh, I request this sir to plan the uh, present plan to Amit Kumar sir and Kalavi Thank you, sir. I, knew, I now request uh, T. Sujata, Senior Director, to introduce the speakers to the gathering. Thank you uh, for giving me this privilege of introducing the speakers. Uh, I will start with uh, Ms. Venu Madhavi Muppala. Uh, she is a partner in EY India's Tax and Regulatory Services. A seasoned professional with uh, 16 years specializing in direct taxes and corporate laws. Her expertise lies in uh, tax advisory, strategy, and guiding multinational companies through entry, compliance, transaction advisory, and exit strategies. She has also played a pivotal role in steering companies through digital transformation. Uh, welcome, Ms. Madhavi, and uh, thank you for gracing the occasion. And uh, now it is about uh, Mr. Amit Kumar uh, Pitkariwal, correct? Is <laughs> a partner in the indirect tax practice at uh, Deloitte uh, Tomatsu India Private Limited, 
and is based out of Hyderabad office. He has more than 18 years of experience in the field of indirect access. Mr. Amit is a commerce graduate from St. Xavier's Kolkata and a member of Institute of Thorough Accountants of India. He also holds a bachelor's degree in law. Uh, I think you should uh, clap for every speaker. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, now it's about Ms. Pallavi Paul. She is a technical director at BSR and uh, CEO company LLP. She is a doctorate degree from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, India. And master's in economics from uh, Calcutta University, specializing in econometrics. She has around 24 years of experience, of which first five years were in the energy energy sector and the last 16, 16 years in uh, transfer pricing. She is a member of the Energy and Environment Committee of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the ESG Committee of CII of the Bengal Chapter. Welcome you, ma'am, and uh, thank you for gracing that agent. And uh, now I request... Uh, uh, we will start this uh, technical session by inviting Ms. May Vedu Madhavi. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Uh, before I start off, it, it's uh, really uh, grateful for me to be admissed all of you. Uh, one specific point which I wanted to share with all of you is that I started my journey with Deloitte. Uh, I was having a four-month four kid and I attended the interview with Mr. Tirumalai sir and uh, he gave me the opportunity. He had multiple <coughs> questions at that point in time whether I'll be able to get through the consulting because I moved my track from industry to consulting at that point in time. I think because of him and his blessings is where I stand today. That is one thing which I wanted to share with all of y'all. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, of course, with uh, sir also, with the industry universe, sir also, I do share. Um, uh, I don't think he, he remembers that. But he was the one um, in one instance for one of my case where I missed quoting. I as an SSC on behalf of my client, I missed quoting one of the favorable decisions for my client and he guided me and I got a favorable order. That was the first one for me at that particular level, getting a success story right at the consultant days. So that's really, uh, I feel very happy and honored today. I missed all these two people sharing this. And uh, yeah, with this, I would like to start off the direct tax proposal. Uh, as you all know that even the earlier speakers have shared, uh, one thing which is very much clear and evident is that we are looking at more towards simplifying the simplifying the taxes. Um, so income tax being hardly wired with lot of intricacies, with uh, where there's a cross reference to multiple sections, etc. I think the objective has been very clear that there is a need for simplifying it. So that is something. The tone is very clear even in this budget. While they have touched almost around 80 odd clauses, but still. Um, the roadmap is towards it. And considering that, uh, if we look back, right, uh, in terms of the corporate tax, uh, it was in financial year 19 as well. There was a concessional tax regime which was given for all the corporates to be applied. And today, with a lot of pride, yesterday when the budget was announced, there was a statistics which was shared with all of us that almost around 58% of the corporates have inclined towards the concessional tax regime that gives an indication that everyone is looking towards simplified tax regime. So amidst uh, a lot of intricacies where the simplified tax regime just focuses only on one deduction, okay? It's just only one deduction. Apart from that, we don't get any other deductions in the concessional tax rate, but still most of the corporates have gone towards it. That shows the roadmap where India is guiding to. Uh, apart from that, even on the individual's front also, two-thirds of the 
individual taxpayers have tilted towards the new regime that's also an indication for us more or less as to how the tone is at the individual level as well apart from the corporate houses um the other important point here is um, also in terms of simplification right um, there is a need for us to look at having a direct tax code in 2009 there was a direct tax code a draft was released at that point in time of course it has not seen the light but there seems to be a need for it now and that is something which has been explicitly mentioned that within 6 months is what we are heading towards it that's something really a welcome move for most of the income tax practitioners as well uh in this direction uh, at least in the budget yesterday there are multiple aspects which have been considered in the same direction one is of course on the capital gain tax the next one is on the tds rate changes which have been brought in the next one is also on the reassessment timeline as well and of course on the charitable organizations also there is lot of uh, between the old regime and the new regime uh, as to how to integrate the old regime into the new regime that is one aspect and also the merger of charitable organizations which was not there earlier that is also something which has been explicitly brought out by introducing a new section there over and above all this of course the vibhag se vishwas scheme which was there while earlier that is the pre covid 2020 as well this was there for us that's something which has been brought in again now with slight modifications not major modifications there but yeah that is also something which they have brought in with this backdrop uh, if we look at from the individual uh, tax proposal standpoint uh, substantial changes have come in in terms of uh, the individuals who are applying the um, the concessional tax rate so there is a before she started off this point of uh, making the amendments the first headline was that 17500 is the tax relief which the individuals will be getting in because of the upcoming proposals is what was the statement which she made of course once we get into the final details uh, certainly you will uh, acknowledge that point yes there is an impact to the extent of 17500 for each of the individuals who actually get into the concessional tax regime uh one um, move is that the standard deduction is something which has been enhanced from 50000 to 75000 of course here again the point is that the individual should have been in the concessional tax regime that is a new regime then only is what this benefit would be applicable the other thing is in terms of the employer contribution to the pension uh it's only for the government and the state government is what uh it was at 14% now they have pegged it even to the corporates as well to get to 14% so that is something a benefit which has been given to uh, the employees as well as to the company the next welcome move is on account of the offset of tcs uh, against the tds uh as far as this point is concerned um, say we as individuals if uh, say take for instance if our if our children go overseas and are traveling uh, abroad or we are traveling overseas and you have made certain payments certainly now there is a factor of tcs which is coming into play so if i as an individual who has that kind of implications already during the year and the employer does not consider that factor and thereby again do a further tds on the overall salary component of course there is always a cash management issue which comes in there so in order to plug that is what this has been brought in such that the tcs also has to be considered by the employer when the 192 withholdings come into play uh of course this is with effect from 1st of october uh, 2024 the next one is on the foreign asset uh this is slightly uh, connected back to the binami as well to a certain extent uh the point here is um if at all if an individual has not reported or has misreported without specifying any particular limits is what um, there has been a penal consequences which were envisaged earlier now that is something there has been a capping there uh, typically in order to address like say take for instance uh, the gccs here in hyderabad okay where they would be having employees who are enrolled in the subsidiaries here in india but are getting esops of the overseas that is of the parent entity those kind of assets are also have to be reported here in india by the individual which most of the ssc's miss 
reporting that. So in order to plug that is what, if at all, if the limit has not crossed 20 lakh, then in that case, there is no penal consequences, but otherwise there will be a penal consequences. Uh, of course, there is a carve out for immovable property in this case. While these were from the individual tax standpoint, uh, the other thing is um, there has been a rationalization as well on the capital gain uh, transactions. In terms of the period of holding, earlier we used to have, a win the period of holding used to range between 12, there was one category of 12 months, the other one was 24 months, the next one was 36 months. So now it has been done away there. We only have 12 months or 24 months. A very simplified structure is what they have brought in here. And as far as all these amendments are concerned, this amendment in specific on rationalization of capital gains is effective from yesterday. That is on, on or after 23rd of September. If any transactions have been undertaken, then this would be the impact for us. So uh, the point here is uh, in terms of long-term capital gains in the case of listed assets, uh, the period of holding has to be seen as a 12-month criteria. And other than listed assets, it could be any asset other than listed. When I say listed assets, it would be equity or it could be equity oriented fund or it could be uh, the other category would be the units of the business trust. Only these particular categories are considered as the uh, listed equities. Other than that, rest all fall into the other assets category only. So if at all, if this kind of classification is there and you are crossing the uh, 12 month window, then only is what you have a long term capital gain trigger in the case of listed assets. In that particular circumstance, the tax rate would be, earlier it was 10%, now has been enhanced to 12.5%. That is one. And in the context, if it is a short-term capital gain, earlier, which was at 15%, has now been enhanced to 20%. The other category, that is the other than the listed equities, in that there is a welcome change there. Earlier, this the tax rate used to be at 20%, has now come down to 12.5%. As far as short-term capital gain is concerned, there is no change in the tax rate. Earlier also, it used to be at the slab rate. The same continues even now post the uh, budget. Uh, one important point here, which I would like to highlight is in specific in cases, if you're dealing with transactions with a non-resident, if there is a transfer by a non-resident, so NR is transferring its stake in an Indian entity to another company. It could be R or an NR. In that particular circumstance, if it is a long-term capital gain, earlier we used to have the benefit of 10% without indexation, right? Of course, we used to take the benefit of foreign exchange fluctuation. That is also something which is done away with. We will be having in that particular circumstance also the tax rate of 12.5%. That is one uh, major impact. Uh, as far as this change is concerned, uh, if you ask me, there is a lot of... Um, um, happiness among the PE investors in specific, but when it comes to the capital markets, it has hit badly there. Uh, the other uh, point uh, uh, in terms of the indexation piece, the indexation benefits have been done away with. Uh, this is one drastic change which has come up. Uh, the earlier the indexation benefit in terms when you're doing a property sale, right? Say if you had an ancestral property or for that matter, you have acquired a property in that particular circumstance after four years or five years down the line, if you're transferring that particular property, you do the index cost of acquisition and then is what the capital gain calculations are being made and accordingly subject to tax. The indexation benefit is no longer there. So this is majorly hitting the real estate companies, well, you'll see a drastic change here. The other uh, important point here is also in terms of the companies who would have created a defer tax asset in their books on account of indexation benefit, there also you'll see an impact. And especially in the case of listed entities, you will see an impact on their EPS as well, because it's going to affect their ETR. Uh, I'll just take a pause here before I move on if any specific questions, because this is something a very critical topic for us on the capital gain front. Uh, while this is certainly considered as a rationalized move, but uh, I think it's majorly the real estate sector which has hit badly on this front. If any specific questions, yeah. Uh, 
have to pay it on the side. Yeah. And uh, we have to. We'll be doing index section also. You are referring to March twenty four transactions, sir. Yes. Yes. Yeah, March twenty four. There is no impact. Okay. This will have an impact of the transactions which have happened from yesterday. Okay. So what happens now is, yeah. See, in the real estate, when we give a land for development or whatever, so the we pay initial tax, long term capital gain tax in the year at and um, at which the it is converted into, uh, or we have to transfer it to for development purpose. Yeah. Okay. So now. This whatever tax we pay now on the asset, it will be deducted from the tax payable in future. Yes. So will they deduct the entire tax paid, or will they say that mm -hmm. since we are using indexation in the FY24, you are not eligible, so only for twelve point five percent divided by twenty percent only will carry forward the benefit. Some some mitigation may come. Not really, sir, because this. It was explicitly mentioned in the section also that the transactions which will happen on or after twenty third of July. So if the GDA has happened before itself, yes, okay, mm. then that is not going to impact at all. So whatever tax we are we are paying now, total amount will be deducted. Yes. And uh, tomorrow, if the department says you have already indexed and paid the tax. So the, the transaction of entering into a JDA was free. Yes, right? yes, yes. So there, it's not a problem. So this entire thing will be considered as a tax paid. Yes. And whatever payable, it will be deducted. Yeah. So there are no issues like that. No litigation will come tomorrow saying that you have availed indexation. You paid like this. You paid this percentage. So there should be some clarity from the department regarding these issues. Whatever we are paying now, it will be more or less considered as advance tax. Because we are we are converting them into short term immediately in the next year. Okay. So even in the memorandum also, this point has been highlighted there that it is only for the transactions which will happen after only. So if at all any any pre and part subsequently if it is happening, then yes, like you mentioned, there could be a proportionate impact. But otherwise, no, there should not be. At least the intent is very clear of the law. Yeah, that will still hold good. If any properties which are acquired pre two thousand one, the fair market value as on two thousand one will still be considered. Yeah. I have a doubt on this uh, on two aspects. One aspect is on the TCS and TDS merger. Now, what you have indicated is in your uh, the merger. So, as I understand, the this new uh, uh, provision which is come in, it's binding only on the uh, on the employer. As far as the income tax is concerned, the TCS credit which was there should anyway be given as credit to the assessee. Correct. Yes. Yeah. That was one thing. Yeah. The second point is now, uh, if this is effective, the capital gain tax is effective today. Then while filing the return for the current financial year, 24-25, we'll have two sections of capital gains. Yes. Yeah. So one pre 23rd and another post 23rd. Yeah. So that will be both for long term capital gain 120 112A. As well as the real estate, so real estate will continue to be on the index basis, be pre twenty fourth and post twenty fourth, it will be on on a yeah in the new one fine. yes and right. uh, and the uh, FMB as of so there accordingly uh, as you rightly mentioned there, uh, so in the upcoming year right for so the current year, even our forms also have to be enabled in that way, so that is something which will happen even in the ITRs also. Okay. Because it's the same section, but split into two parts, right? The so tax rates yeah. also are different. There. Correct. And then uh, the FMB as of one four two thousand one, that is yeah, eligible still, for. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, but again, it depends uh, because it all depends upon the index cost of acquisition. So one has to really look into the math there as to which one would be beneficial. Uh, the next one is on uh, rationalization of the TDS rates. Um, as you all can see, we have listed down all the sections here in terms of where the rate changes have happened. Broadly, if you observe, uh, the rates which were at 5% has been plugged down to 2%. That is one uh, move which is there. Apart from that, um, the other important point is in terms of 190, uh, 194, 
Oh, in terms of the e-commerce transactions, earlier it was 10% was the withholding, now has been reduced to 0.1%. Uh, the other uh, point is in terms of LLPs and also for the partnership firms, where the partners are being paid the remuneration or the salaries, earlier there was no TDS enabler there. Now that is something which has been brought in through introduction of a new section wherein the withholding has to happen at 10%. And of course, this will be effective from 1st of April 2025. Now, with specific reference to foreign taxpayers, um, uh, as we already discussed earlier, the tax rate is something which has been plugged down from 40% to 30%. And of course, the surcharge and the test remains the same. There is no change there. That is one. Uh, the other point is that uh, abolition of the e-commerce uh, equalization levy. Um, earlier, the 2% equalization levy was the responsibility of the overseas party to make the uh, payment of equalization levy. So that is something which has been done away with, away, uh, with effects from 1st of August. Um, and uh, the, the reason as to why this has been brought in is this is connected back to the BEPS as well on the digital assets. So the, the plan is that... The, uh, any of the countries should not be having any in tax implications on the digital assets in order to introduce the BEPS program. So that as a part of that is what this has been abolished. Actually, that is the intent behind the abolition of this particular provision. The other uh, point is in terms of non-residents who are operating the cruise ships. Um, there is a blanket that 20% of their uh, revenue has to be considered as a taxable income. So more like a presumptive taxation is what this has been brought in and uh, accordingly tax will be levied. So that is something which they have been explicitly brought in for the cruise, more from a tourism standpoint. The next one is on reducing the tax litigation that is on the Vibhatse Vishwas. So um, while there are multiple aspects on this slide, um, Earlier, uh, we used to have that when initially when 2020, when it was introduced, approximately around uh, 1, 1 lakh 50,000 cases is what was addressed under this particular scheme. And moreover, in terms of the disputed tax demand, it was almost around 1 lakh crore of rupees, which was settled completely through this particular scheme. Uh, if we look into the finer details there uh, as to who all can apply earlier in 2020 scheme versus in 2024? It's just the same. I would rather call it as like um, whatever was earlier applicable, the same continues even now. Only one point where there is a change is that uh, earlier we used to have that if there is an 143.3 order and I have a time limit for filing the CIT appeal and the, um, the cutoff date at that point in time was 31st of Jan 2020. Okay, so if at all, if there was an appeal pending also, those cases also could be covered under Vishwas uh, Vishwa scheme, but that is something which is not there in the current one which has been introduced. That is one change uh, which you can see as far as the overall coverage of the cases. So any appeals which are pending before the CIT appeal or before the high court or the tribunal uh, or the SLP cases, all those things can be covered under uh, this particular scheme. The other point is that uh, they have made it into two parts because this is something which is yet to be notified. So if at all, if this gets notified immediately, they have carved out into two sections. If an SSE is going forward pre 31st of December 2024, and if they are going post, there's a small incremental tax rate difference. That is one arbitrage which is there if someone who is the early mover, uh, that is one important point. The other thing is that if at all, if you have uh, issues in terms of interest and penalty matters itself, or if you have specifically on the disputed tax plus the interest and penalty, there is a separate carve outs which they have made. Otherwise, overall, whatever was applicable earlier, it still continues to be the same even in the new one as well. The other important point to note here is um, in terms of, uh, say, if the department has gone for an appeal and you're fighting out as an SSC in that particular circumstance, if the SSC wants to go ahead in, that, in this particular scheme, 
50 percent of whatever was the tax rate which is given in the above table right there is a relief given so if we want to just buy piece there that is also something which has been explicitly mentioned uh, the other uh, point is um, also in terms of the uh, coverage like say take for instance in the prior year we have a favorable high court order or a tribunal order but in the subsequent year if the matter is still pending and you want to go under this particular scheme even then also your tax impact would be 50 percent of what it would have been otherwise of course interest and penalty is something which will not be there so that's the move which is being taken The next one is uh, in terms of widening the tax base. Um, the first point is in terms of the buyback tax. So as we all know, there is a buyback tax. If the company takes the shares back, right? There is a buyback tax to the extent of 23%. Uh, and in the hands of the shareholders, it is an exempt transaction. So this provision is something which will be done away with, with effect from 1st of October, 2024. So this will be considered like that of a deemed dividend. Okay, The very classification has changed because uh, while it is a capital asset for a, for a company or for any person for that matter, the very classification changes into a dividend there. And so accordingly, it will be subject to uh, dividend tax provision. And the other important point is that all the withholdings which you will be having in the context of dividend, right? Say, if it is a, in a domestic, it is 10%, and if it is a non-resident, it is 20%, right? All those implications will get applied here. And uh, you might certainly have a question here, okay, what would happen to my cost of acquisition? Because when I purchase the shares, I would have had certain cost of acquisition. That is something which you're not factoring at all. That, so that will be considered as a capital loss, and you will be in a position to carry forward. Now, this is something uh, which has hit the market badly. Uh, the reason being, um, of course, there's a bit of room for planning as well here. Uh, say, take for instance, um, if the company has issued CCDs, okay? CCDs are something which they have explicitly mentioned that uh, maturity of the CCDs will be considered as a short-term capital gain, which is something, an introduction which has come into this particular budget. So if the company wants to uh, convert the CCDs into equity, Okay, rather than getting into getting into the track of maturity of the CCDs, that conversion is something with the if it is a non-resident with the AD banker approval is what you can convert the CCDs. Okay. Post that, either you do pre first of October itself, do a buyback. So uh, upon conversion of the CCD into an equity, there is no capital gain there for you. Okay, it is an exempt transaction. Subsequent to that, if you're doing a buyback on the incremental portion is what you will be having a 23%, which will be very nominal there. Thereby, you will not have major tax impact, which otherwise you would have had if it was considered as a short-term capital gain on account of maturity of a CCD. That is one point. The other uh, point could also be is that, um, say if it is a non-resident and the non-resident uh, shares are getting, there is a buyback of the shares from the non-resident. Now, as far as the domestic loss is concerned, post 1st of October, it is to be considered as a dividend, right? So under the local laws, you will consider it as a dividend, but when it comes to from the respective treaty standpoint, whether the classification still remains as a dividend or will it be seen as a CG is also a point of debate, which is, there because of this amendment because the very nature of the transaction has undergone a change which otherwise would have been a cg has become a dividend so there is some bit of litigation surrounding that particular aspect as well which we will certainly see in the upcoming ones because of this amendment the other um, point is uh, in terms of the house properties uh, so if an individual or for that matter any person who is having multiple house properties and has given it on rent, always there is a possibility that you consider that as a part of your um, business income, or it could be that as a house property. There was a room for planning in that particular. This is also something which has been plugged away now, where it has to be considered as income from house property. One cannot consider as income from a business or profession. If it is rented, uh, if the property is rented uh, to the outsiders, 
and the specific mention is given that this is for the residential house properties. Of course, if there are some commercial spaces, still the room for planning is still open there. Uh, the next one on widening of the tax base uh, on the, under the same theme, um, earlier, uh, typically in the group restructure, reorg, right? Um, the most prevalent structure is that um, in the overseas geographies, uh, one of the entity gives to the other, and thereby we say that it is an exempt transaction because gift is an exempt one under section 47. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, controversies or litigation surrounding this. How is it possible for a corporate to give gift? Okay, it is. It has to be like from a human. There has to be some uh, element of human involved there. Otherwise, gift is something which is not possible. Over and above, when GAR came in, this is something which they, uh, which was plugged to a certain extent because of the GAR provisions as well. But still, companies have still gone ahead and have taken the benefit of this particular section of 47, considering that gift by one corporate to the other is an exempt transaction. Now, this is also something which has been done away with. Only the individuals and HAFs can give the gifts. The next one um, is in terms of the uh, IPO process. So uh, if I have to just give an example uh, here, um, say if, if I was a promoter and I'm looking at going for a listing of a particular, of my own company, there's something called as an offer for sale uh, during the process of IPO, which we get into, okay? So at that point in time, when the promoter is exiting the share, there is something which we arrive at the cost of acquisition of the share at that point in time during the offer for sale. As far as the current provisions are concerned under section 55A, uh, in terms of the IPO process, during the IPO process, if, the, if an individual or person is going under the uh, offer for sale, as to how to arrive at the cost of acquisition was not given, and uh, so accordingly, the real computation mechanism of CG itself fails, and this has been seconded by multiple councils, very well-renowned councils. So most of the SSEs, especially the promoters in the recent past who have gone for IPO process, have gone ahead and have not paid taxes there. So in order to plug that is what this amendment has been brought in, wherein they have explicitly mentioned that, if at all during the IPO process, if there is an offer for sale, the cost of acquisition has to be computed basis the fair value as on 31st of Jan. So the methodology is something which is already prescribed there. So they have just brought in this particular clause there. And uh, as far as this amendment is concerned, it is a retrospective amendment because this section was introduced in, with effect from assessment year 1890. So accordingly, there is a retrospective amendment. So a lot of impact from the for those promoters who would have planned otherwise. And uh, of course, there would be again the interest and the penal consequences as well. Uh, this is a small change here, um, specific mention to the ones which are colored in green there. Uh, in terms of the futures and options as well, the STT uh, charge outs have been increased there, the rates have been increased. Otherwise, the rest all remains the same. This is with effect from, again, 1st of October 24. Moving on to the next one, that is on the rationalization measures uh, in terms of the reassessment proceedings. So uh, this, this provision has been effective from 1st of September. That is what. So typically, if we see the, the way the reassessment proceedings used to be for us from a timeline standpoint was, we have, a, uh, so recently when there was an amendment, we had a four, three years versus the 10 year time limit. Now the 10 year time limit has been reduced and accordingly it has been brought into five years, three months. So if there is any uh, income which has escaped assessment and there is a, uh, that can be connected back to an asset or to an expense or any particular um, transaction as a book entry, then though in those circumstances is what we used to have a 10 year window. Now that is something which has been reduced to five years, three months window to initiate the proceedings. The next one is in terms of delay in deposit of uh, TDS. So I'm sure most of you would have recently encountered this prosecution proceedings in the context of 276B. 
wherein um, the company as well as the promoter, uh, sorry, not the promoter, the principal officer uh, will be considered to be eligible for the prosecution proceedings if TDS has been deducted but has not been deposited to the government account. So it is nothing but we keep the government money with us and conduct the business activity. In that particular circumstance is what the 276B triggers off. In that particular circumstance, when the prosecution proceedings get initiated, there are two paths for us again there. Either we go ahead with the proceedings so once there is a prosecution order, then we again for the contest before the High Court. That is one part there. The other part is that, no, I would like to have buy a piece there. Then in that particular circumstance, we go to the compounding route. So there was an explicit mention on this particular aspect in her budget as well yesterday, where she had highlighted that there will be a proper SOP which has to be put in place. Now, is it that um, the the so-called the promoters, okay, because the promoters also come into the ambit here, wherein uh, they will be considered as the key personnel there, and uh, they also will be to be considered for the prosecution proceedings, okay? So any individual who is at that particular stake, for sure would not prefer to go ahead, so they, thereby they go for compounding. That person may not even know in terms of what's happening in the finance team in that particular organization. So there is certain expectation here, which was there in the up, uh, pre as well, that certain officers have to be removed off. Basically, the promoters at least have to be removed off from that particular basket. That is something which has not been addressed, at least in this budget. But yeah, one welcome move here is that, say, in, if there was a withholding which has happened, but has not been deposited as what was given earlier, so if at all the deposit has been made before we file the TDS return for that particular quarter, then the penalty procedure, the prosecution proceedings cannot be initiated. That is one change which has been brought in uh, as far as this section is concerned. So the next one is in terms of um, filing the appeals uh, before the tribunal. Of course, uh, earlier there was a 60 days window for us, 60 days from the date of communication of the uh, appealable order. Now they have brought it to uh, two months from the end of the uh, yeah, two months from the end of the month in which the appealable order was passed. So that's the one change which has been brought in. Uh, thereby, slight there will be a bit of relaxation for the uh, SSEs as well. Uh, the next one is in terms of obtaining the lower withholding certificate. I'm sure, uh, especially where uh, the companies have lower taxabilities, etc., we do apply, approach the tax authorities at the start of the year and ask for a lower withholding certificate for most of our SSEs. Um, here, they have explicitly brought in in the context of 194O transactions. Um, so, if at all um, on purchase of goods. Uh, also, there is a withholding tax, right? So, in those SSEs are also eligible to go for a lower withholding certificate. That is one addition which has been brought up here. Now, coming on to bar, the bar transactions, the board for advanced ruling. Um, so, when the when there was a change from the ARs to the bar uh, bars, the point which came out was that uh, the very construct of the advanced ruling authorities versus the uh, board for um, advanced rulings, there was a lot of difference in terms of who were holding the chair. Okay, So most of the SSEs went back to withdrawal, while there was a withdrawal application made, but that has not been given effect till date. So there is a provision which has been brought in now here that if at all, if the SSE has made an application to the authority for advanced rulings and the matter has not been admitted, okay then there is a possibility for those SSEs to go back and ask for a withdrawal of their cases before the bar. That is one. Uh, the time limit here has been given to the SSEs to the extent of 31st of October. And uh, the other point is that after making an application, they also have to reciprocate back within 31st of December is what they have to withdraw as well. So there has to be an order which has to be passed by them. So this is something really a welcome move because those SSEs who would have filed erstwhile, and because of the bar not functioning uh, at respective places, there is a lot of issue which is going on there. So in order to plug that is what this has been brought in. The next one is on the angel tax or the premium tax. Okay. 
So here there is an amendment with regard to uh, 56.2.7b transactions. So if a company has received um, at the time of issue of shares a premium that is nothing but more than their market values, the FMV, which the FMV has to be calculated based on the Rule 11 UA computation again. If at all, if there is an excess amount which has been received by the company, then that would be subject to tax as income from other sources. That was the law at that point in time. Okay. Now, uh, they have brought in a change here that that is no longer there. Um, so, uh, if I look back, earlier it was applicable only for the residents who used to infuse the tax, uh, infuse money into the company. Then later on, they brought in the non-residents into the ambit. Then again, there was an amendment that you no know, startups should be given the benefit. Startups in specific who had the approvals is what were eligible for it. Okay. Then now, so completely the section is something which they have done away with. So this is something really a welcome move for most of the ones who are looking at um, incorporating the companies at a premium. Uh, the next one is um, in terms of um, the specified domestic transactions. Uh, so uh, here the amendment is that, um, say if the company has uh, reported in 3CEB, a domestic, specified domestic transaction, or missed reporting it, or for that matter, when the assisting officer would have given reference to the TPO and has missed giving reference to that, even in that particular circumstance, TPO can look into the specified domestic transactions when the TP uh, assessment is going on. So that is the change which has been brought in here. Or the next one is in case of SSE in default, uh, as far as the time limit is concerned, uh, the earlier time limit was seven years for, uh, for the 201 proceedings to be completed. Uh, now that has been reduced to, um, sorry, seven years, and now it has been brought down to six years. And uh, earlier this was not applicable for non-residents, which they have now brought the non-residents into this ambit. I think these were the major ones. Uh, of course, there are certain things like um, uh, with regard to the search proceedings, the block assessment concept, which used to be erstwhile, that is something which they have brought in now back. So in the search cases, that is something which is really a very welcome move uh, because the block concepts were not there in the recent past. So that is one. Um, apart from that, um, the other thing was in the context of charitable uh, associations, which I think all the speakers have already highlighted there. Uh, one important point, I just want to connect back to the point which you raised, sir. So in terms of uh, undisclosed income, right? Um, so there it is 77.5% is the tax rate for us there. But in the case, in the context, if same undisclosed income is being seen in the such cases, the tax rate is 60% only, okay? There is no surcharge in CES right now because it refers back to uh, section 113 where there is no uh, surcharge in CES. So that is something which if you see really, then in the case of search and seizure cases, such cases only is what this seems to be more beneficial there rather than in the general context. So that's something which is a point there. And uh, of course, uh, when it comes to charitable institutions, right, uh, there is a great welcome move there uh, is in terms of merger of two charitable associations also is something which they have brought in by introducing a new section because um, as far as the merger of trust or societies is concerned, this was not there because there used to be an exit tax which used to get levied when there is a merger which, used to, which we used to plan earlier. So this is something really a welcome move for the uh, for the trusts who are looking at having a merger. I think, yeah, these were the major ones. Uh, unless if you have any specific doubts, we are happy to take them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for uh, elaborately uh, explaining on, di on direct tax proposals in the budget. I now request the Amit Kumar to take the session on direct tax proposals in the matter.
Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the outset, thank you to the Federation for uh, providing me an opportunity to discuss the indirect tax aspect on the budget. So, uh, uh, in the same, uh, from the previous pre ADPC, pre GST era, the budget used to be uh, like there used to be excise, lot more amendments and all, but post GST, uh, uh, from the uh, post GST budget, has always concentrated on two things. One was, of course, on the custom side, which is always aligned with the government policy, whether the last few years it's always on the rationalization of the taxes or make in India or Atman Nirbhar Bharat. So customs policies, changes, amendments uh, is always aligned to that. And amendments in GST uh, were always uh, more on implementing the uh, council decision. As you would be aware that the any changes in the GST has to be approved by the or recommended by the GST Council. So, so we have uh, last on 22nd June, we had a Marathon GST Council meeting where a lot more changes were made, many changes were, most of the changes I would say uh, trade uh, uh, beneficial. There were several of those changes required the amendment in the act. So we would uh, we would see most of the changes were basically what proposed is to implement uh, the council's decisions. Uh, so in light of that, I'll just try to uh, discuss a few uh, specific changes from the GST perspective. One was uh, 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 the most, uh, uh, one changes which was section 11A, which is introduced uh, and which is to empower the government to exempt the taxes or non levy the taxes uh, in case where the taxes were not paid uh, on account of say the industry practice. Uh, this was always there in the excise regime where section 11C was there. And uh, excise regime we have seen many times there were disputes on say classification where SSC say they were paying say taxes at say 6% and the actual rate say was later on decided either by the rulings and also 12. And government was empowered to in those genuine cases to uh, uh, forego the differential taxes in uh, uh, for the trade, for the benefit of the trade. So similar provisions have been brought in in the GST Act, where now the government is empowered based on uh, uh, the uh, uh, the newly introduced section where they can basis the representation from the industry or if there are any future subsequent decisions, uh, say by the court where the tax has increased. In those cases, uh, government can uh, exempt or non levy the taxes. Uh, one example I can give would be say the recently there was a uh, last in 2022 there was a decision uh, from the Supreme Court on the Supreme Court in the case of a northern uh, operating where they have said that supply of uh, say the deputation of a man uh, employee by the uh, uh, overseas uh, parent company to an Indian. Uh, uh, subsidiary was classified as a supply of manpower services. And before that, there were several decisions of the tribunal and few dismissal of the SLP where it was always held as a, as an employee-employee relationship. So all the SSCs and all, nobody was paying any uh, service tax or GST on this transaction. But post that decision, there were several uh, uh, there were uh, investigations across and, uh, and all the SSCs were of course, uh, they were made to pay the taxes uh, because the uh, court ruling was uh, very clear. So, so now we have at least the government has incorporated the power, uh, uh, similar power to the excise where basis the industry representation and all. Uh, they are empowered uh, basis uh, uh, the discussion or recommendation of council to uh, forego the or non levy the taxes in those genuine cases. Uh, uh, then another uh, trade, facil uh, trade uh, facilitation measure would be in terms of the retrospective amendment for under section 16 on the time limit, uh, uh, which uh, Mr. Asad has also mentioned that where the government has of course given the power uh, or the extended the time limit up to 30th November for the input credit uh, for the cases up to 2021. Uh, but of course, it came a bit late because of course there are many cases we have seen where SSCs in uh, where the demands are not very high. Specifically, they have most of the cases uh, they have reversed the input credit. So, so provisions have come where you can't take back the credit. So, if you have already paid the taxes on those accounts, that will not be there. But those cases where uh, uh, SSCs are still uh, challenging and they are at various uh, um, judicial forum, they can avail the benefit of uh, this amendment. Uh, uh, another one, again, it is a very technical provision under, uh, for the case of a transitional credit under 140 subsection 7, where they have clarified that uh, the, for the distribution of the input credit by the ISD, invoice can be uh, raised even prior to uh, 38 June. 
uh, whereas i would have personally i would have also expected that similar uh, amendment if it was there under 140 subsection 5 which is a case where uh, the transactional credit uh, on the invoices where the input credit or the goods or services were received earlier uh, early, uh, later but the invoices were dated prior to that but we specifically we have seen in service cases uh, input services and all where uh, they have given the time limit of accounting up to 30th uh, or 31st august uh, 2017 and if we have accounted those invoices which are dated up to 30th june and credit was availed and transition to the gst regime now we are fighting many cases where uh, specifically for services it is very difficult to prove when the services were received and in most of the cases services were received by 30th june invoices were also raised but because of the accounting processing of the invoices and all they have not accounted as on 30th june and we are fighting several cases where uh, 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 basis the wording under 140 subsection 5 that this since these invoices were dated prior to that uh, which reflect that the services were received and it is not a case of in transit which can always happen in goods Uh, so that is still the expectation uh, which is still pending uh, and then uh, other trade facilities and measures again is for the insurance sector because insurance sector last few years there were several dgci investigations across india and uh, several insurance companies they have been made to pay deposit during investigations on the uh, gst on the reinsurance uh, uh, apportionment so they have exempted that by including under schedule 3 and this will help all the insurance sector to minimize and close the litigations which are pending at various levels uh, uh, another uh, uh, amendment in relating to the time limit in case of the reverse charge so again there uh, there was a uh, uh, the supreme court decision which i have discussed uh, so as you know that section 16 sub section 4 provides for the time limit of availing the input credit by 30th september earlier and now 30th november By, for the filing of the return for the uh, October month, so which is effectively 30th November, that if any input credit, say for 23, 24, if we have to take, uh, we can take only by uh, 30th November. Uh, and there are several times, uh, many cases where the reverse charge, specifically where the input credit, uh, uh, the reverse charge liability itself is paid say after two years, which is one instance is based on the Supreme Court decision uh, where the reverse charge liability on import of service on that expats or manpower they were all paid belatedly for 1st july 2017 onward gst was paid uh, say in 2023 24 and all and there was always a doubt that uh, since the service pertains to the period for which the time is, has already been lapsed can the credit be taken so now in the last council meeting uh, they have clarified and basis that they have also amended under section 13 uh, sub section 3 as well as uh, section 31 to provide that in case of the rcm uh, the time of supply can be based on when you raise the self invoice and once the self invoice is dated currently even for the past services there will not be any dispute as far as the uh, uh, input credit eligibility is there uh, then again the uh, refund related where the uh, section 54 provides for the refund of the input credit or the gst paid as uh, on the export of goods and services uh, uh, in that earlier the provisions on the good export of goods uh, where the uh, ssc are claiming the refund uh, the provisions were restricting the uh, refund in case where the any of the products were subject to export duty for example uh, iron and steel and all many times those products were always subject to export uh, duty to safeguard so there uh, the restrictions earlier was uh, for the refund of the accumulated credit now they have provided even for the rebate method where if you pay the uh, igst on export of goods which are subject to the export duty now refund cannot be there so so no refund in case of uh, any goods which are uh, subject to the export duty uh, uh, another uh, just a procedural uh, uh, amendment where the tds returns which is required to be filed say by the government or e-commerce uh, Uh, operator the uh, earlier uh, there was a confusion where the tds return to be filed uh, in a month where there were no deductions made so they have uh, amended to provide that nil return uh, also need to be filed and then there are few changes regarding the e-commerce and uh, the uh, cancellation is again the uh, we have seen uh, 
there are several high court decisions and there are several cases across india where uh, the uh, uh, registrations are being revoked so now they have amended and they, uh, uh, it is expected that the government will come up with the rules where they will provide that what are the uh, procedures which need to be followed in case of uh, revocation of uh, gst registrations um, another uh, important change which was again discussed uh, uh, during the gst council meeting was uh, that the, the government has has now provided by way of introduction of section 74a the common timeline for the assessment uh, where whether it is uh, any tax is, which is deducted underpaid or erroneous refund or anything uh, whether it is by, uh, either voluntary or because of the interpretation where the fraud or evasion is not involved and always uh, or there was always the extended timeline where the fraud or suppression or evasion of the taxes were involved so this was always there even under the excise and service tax regime uh, and all. now government has provided the common adjudication guideline by way of introduction 74a and time has been provided whether it is a case of uh, non payment of tax with or without uh, evasion of ta uh, taxes and uh, uh, the time limit is 42 months from the due date of filing the annual return for the previous year for which uh, the determination is to be made so this is definitely a welcome rel uh, relief because always there is a confusion on whether uh, there is a suppression or evasion or not because there are many cases where or we have seen uh, many cases routine if their time uh, has lapsed or uh, it is missed out. We have seen that the department has uh, many times invoked the, the extended period of limitation. We have seen uh, uh, that as sometime as a routine case also. And always there is a thin line of difference whether the tax is paid uh, because of the genuine uh, mistake or uh, interpretation issue or is there an evasion. So, 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 so by having a common time limit, uh, whether in both the cases, it will actually help in streamlining the assessment process. Uh, of course, there, uh, there are uh, different nuances like they have. Uh, like as uh, uh, Mr. Saad has also discussed that they have also now specifically clarified that penalty of 10% minimum penalty will be paid, uh, uh, will be levyable wherever uh, there is a, a non-payment of self-assessed tax beyond the due date, uh, beyond 30 days from the due date, or if you have collected the tax and not paid uh, in both the cases, uh, those provisions were there in the few act also. For example, even in Telangana VAT Act, similar provisions were there. That if you have delayed uh, the payment, uh, 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 which is due based on the return, there was a mandatory penalty uh, which was imposed. So similar provisions have been um, uh, incorporated. And of course, this can be challenging because sometimes uh, the returns are also not filed or delayed filed because of a different issue other than uh, the evasion. So, so leaving a mandatory penalty of 10% definitely can be a challenge. Uh, uh, Pre-deposit, of course, there, there was a free, uh, in the council meeting, again, there was a reduction in the pre-deposit, uh, uh, the overall amount, which has been from 40 crore, uh, 50 crore to 40 crore in case of the first appeal and uh, similar uh, uh, where they're made in second appeal. Uh, uh, the Another big uh, move, which is again in line with the uh, uh, the amendment or the scheme provided under the Income Tax Act, uh, which is Vivas Seviswad scheme. So similarly, under GST, which is a long-standing demand, was there from the trade to have the MNST scheme provided for uh, to take care of the initial uh, year. And if we recall, we also had uh, similar schemes uh, post introduction of GST in 2019, the LDRS scheme or uh, Sabka Viswas Negative Dispute uh, Resolution Scheme. So now GST also, they have proposed uh, 128A, where they have provided the uh, waiver of uh, interest and penalty if tax is paid within the notified date. Uh, uh, again, they have provided the conditions. Of course, we need to wait for the detailed rule, uh, but there are conditions basically it would apply uh, for, uh, for the notices. Uh, first criteria is there should be at least a SOPUS notice issued under 73. Uh, and uh, uh, depending on whether notice at what stage, whether it is notice or it is concluded in the assessment order and all, it has been provided uh, that uh, if tax is paid within the notified uh, time, uh, there will be a complete waiver from interest and penalty. So there are few issues which I could think as of now is there are many cases where say the taxpayer has paid the uh, tax. One example is again the uh, basis the Supreme Court decision. Uh, many SSCs, they have paid the taxes, but they have not paid interest on the interpretation that Supreme Court decision has brought something which was not there. 
in 2022 because prior to that all decisions were uh, in favor of the SSC. So companies have taken a stand the interest is not payable for those years, but they paid the taxes. Now, whether those kind of uh, cases will get covered because there is no underlying so called notice. Uh, then there are, of course, uh, uh, many cases which we have seen that notices are issued by ext under uh, by uh, extended period of limitation because many cases we have seen 73 since the, uh, the last uh, date of uh, the assessment was nearing or issuing the notice. Notices were issued under 74 and uh, on a routine manner. Now, uh, the problem will be at the notice stage, uh, it can't be, we cannot apply for the, uh, uh, for under this scheme. One has to fight for and get uh, get a benefit under 73 and then decide to get it covered. So again, it poses a challenge. So so I'm sure that uh, in uh, the uh, earlier, uh, that uh, the Sabka Viswas, that LDR scheme under excise service tax also, government has issued a circular where through a circular they have widen the scope of the benefit because the always the understanding was that to give the benefit to the trade. So I am sure that we will also expect the rules and maybe a circular where these uh, uh, these issues may be addressed. So we have to wait for the procedural uh, procedure as well as the clarification from the government to see what is covered or to what, what an extent one can get the benefit. But of course, this is restricted up to the matters which is up to 2020. So initial three years of uh, the implementation of GST and it's not there for uh, current. So one has to be mindful and... Uh, then anti profiteering is just a case because the uh, uh, the earlier it was always uh, uh, the uh, the appeals and all it was all uh, lying either before the competition commission or the high court so they have uh, uh, notified that the tribunal will be set up and that tribunal uh, they will notify which will have uh, which will handle the anti profiteering uh, uh, matter under the gst uh, another one uh, uh, amendment, maybe it is beneficial for, of course, the uh, the uh, tax professional is earlier the all the summons proceedings uh, under GST they have never allowed the AR to go because it is always the summon uh, is to the person and uh, that person alone can uh, appear. Now they have also amended and they have allowed uh, that uh, summons proceedings can be also undertaken uh, appearance can be through the authorized representative. So. So it is, uh, in one sense, uh, it's uh, again a trade facilitation because we have seen many cases, uh, notices uh, or summons are being uh, sent to directors, promoters and all. And uh, sometimes it becomes a genuine difficulty to appear, uh, 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 cause the appearance by the director or promoter. So in those cases, authorized representative, it can be even the employee of the company. So they can at least represent on behalf of the named person the uh, summon notice. So this is again a welcome measure from the trade perspective. Moving on from the customs, as I said, that the customs theme is always to uh, in uh, alignment with the government uh, uh, theme on make in India or the, or argument the domestic manufacturing by increasing the value addition from last few years and uh, even uh, the uh, customs amendment which we have seen is all in line with that. Uh, we have seen that uh, and of course uh, similar to the direct tax announcement where. It was mentioned that six months, within six months, there will be a overall of the uh, income tax law. Same way it has been provided that the customs duty structure also will be revamped within next six months. Uh, that is the timeline. So again, it's a welcoming measure because customs is always one area where lot more, uh, one has to be a little expert, I would say, because it is not merely based on the notification or tariff which is there. One has to look into some 10 or 20 notifications also sometimes to see whether there are exemptions given under some different, different notifications. So if uh, the rationalization will help in reducing, I am assuming, uh, the uh, different exams and notification and uh, uh, it will be a, you know, a helpful. Second amendment again or the proposal is acceptance of self-declaration based proof of origin. So this is again in line with the FTA uh, where the government is, is uh, uh, finalizing the FTA say with UK or UAE. So there are different, different negotiations between uh, the overseas government is going on where Self-certification also is provided by, uh, so today, every time, of course, certificate of origin and, uh, from the country of export, and there are different, different documents, which is uh, prescribed under the Karota rule, but uh, they have also amended to provide that it can be based on some other acceptable document in line with the FTA. So again, it's a trade facilitation measure, I would say. Uh, the third one, again, more 
I don't know if everyone is aware, but for the benefit of this, Mood is basically the bonding license uh, where uh, uh, the earlier under the 58 bond license was only for the storage of the goods. So government in 2019, they have come up with the Mood guideline, which is manufacturing and other operations uh, warehousing rule, where they have provided that any anyone, even if you are a DTA manufacturer and you don't have any export at all, even you can get that license and you can import the goods uh, without payment of duty because duty get deferred till the time you clear the goods for either the export or you clear the goods on DTA. And if you clear the goods say on DTA, that time you pay the duty uh, on uh, raw material which is consumed in say the manufacturing operation or capital goods if you clear after 10 years, that 10 point of, uh, after 10 years you'll be paying the duty without any interest. So it is a scheme to again to augment the manufacturing in India. So in that scheme, uh, there was no mention of any class of person and all. Anybody, uh, any person who is carrying the manufacturing and other operations, they can opt for this uh, scheme. So recently, all the solar companies, uh, all renewable sector, like a solar power generating company, they have also opted for this scheme because electricity is also uh, generated and it's a manufacturing process. It is also listed uh, under the customs and GST schedule as an exempt item. So there was a manufacturing or other operation it qualifies for. So, and as you know, all this uh, import of solar panels and all this equipment, you know, they carry very high duty because government wanted to achieve the make in India. So there was a very high duty of almost 40, 50% is the BCD on all the solar uh, um, uh, panels and uh, module and all. But all these power generating companies, because of this mood scheme, they have applied and all those duty basically got deferred. So that intention of promoting the make in India got defeated in some sense because a company started setting up the power generating plant uh, under this mood scheme. And then there was a circular issue which has denied this benefit. So the government issued circular saying that this scheme is not applicable. And Delhi High Court uh, uh, in May, they have struck down that circular saying there is no um, uh, such uh, provision under the act. So, so it is basically to plug in. We have to see now that whether, when the government will notify uh, the class of persons who are not eligible. But uh, uh, it appears that it is to uh, it is to plug that uh, uh, that solar companies or similar power companies and other uh, they may not get the benefit. So, so this has been uh, uh, amended. So, so we need to wait for the actual notification to come uh, under this rule uh, sections to see if uh, the uh, which are the class of persons uh, which get impacted by this uh, as uh, again i just talked about on the customs duty rationalization so they have already given a roadmap also on few of the uh, so they are working on 192 exemption notification where they have again provided uh, it was this exercise was taken uh, even a couple of years back where they have provided the sunset clause. So now also again, they have uh, provided the different different notification sunset clause and many of them, as you can see, some are 2029, some will end on 31st March 26, and some will end within this year by 30th September. So this is as a part of the rationalization uh, of the custom duty uh, that the government is reviewing this and provided the sunset window to the industry to plan ahead. So that there is no uh, uncertainty that suddenly this exemption will end. So it is a good move uh, in a sense. And again, there we, we can see there are uh, uh, we have just tried to I have just tried to put up in a different different bucket, but uh, 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 from the sector specific government has. Uh, uh, introduced uh, several exemptions or the benefit, for example, for the energy transitioning uh, and mining sector. Of course, we uh, there was a thought process that government may come up again with some new PLI scheme, which is not there, but uh, but PLI scheme can again, uh, depending on the budget allocation, it can be brought in later also. Uh, uh, but we, uh, but there are several schemes, uh, for example, uh, the exemptions and all on the silicon wafer and all, where they have extended the benefit which was ending supposed to be ending, so they have extended till 26. So all these are basically the inputs and all to manufacture the main product and all where they have reduced the benefit or the extended the benefit on the BCD and all. So that the manufacturing process in India or value addition is always augmented and similar is there for the education and skilling sector. 
देन अगेन इन लाइफ साइंस एंड हेल्थ केयर ऑल्सो वी हैव सीन ऑफ कोर्स इट वॉज इन द स्पीच ऑल्सो दैट दे हैव एग्जेप्टेड दी बी सी डी ऑन फ्यू ऑफ द कैंसर ड्रग्स एंड देर आर सिमिलरली फ्यू अदर अमेंडमेंट मेड विथ रिस्पेक्ट टू दी बी सी डी then another technology and media so again there also uh, the the uh, there for the r and d units and all there is exemptions where uh, or the concessional benefit uh, under notification 51 oblique 96 where you can import for the r and d activity at 5% uh, uh, bcd uh, uh, so that again they have notified and they said it will continue till 31st march 2019 so again this is a welcome move and of course this r and d uh, benefit is there for several sector including your uh, pharma and all uh, where they can import at a concessional rate so 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 uh, extending this benefit will definitely help those uh, uh, companies specifically involved in the the r and d sectors i have just listed down but there are uh, uh, there are several such uh, uh, i would say realignment made with respect to the different different sectors for example mobile of course we have, we, everyone expected that they are uh, like rate may go up only but we have already seen that the export of mobile from india in last 5 year i think it has uh, 5 recollect more than 100 time it has increased so already this sector has become uh, uh i would say pioneer sector for the export and uh, more self uh, sufficient many companies have come so there some of the raw material in fact inputs they have reduced the bcd or the product uh, because of, uh, it is more from a competitive environment and because this industry now uh, there may not be more uh, safeguard uh, needed so there are similar such uh, amendments made in uh, or the direction of bcd made uh, uh, with respect to the different different sector in line with the policy uh, so just to conclude uh, i would uh, say that definitely one has to look out one uh, under gst specifically uh, if i have to talk on the mnst scheme to examine all their pending cases i would suggest and and take a holistic approach on whether uh, there is a merit in fighting uh, any of the pending cases or should we pay the tax and uh, interest and penalties avoided because uh, as the previous speakers uh, or the um, uh, president said that sometimes the matters are decided after 5 or 10 years and by the time interest is more than the tax we have seen in many cases we have uh, many cases pending in tribunal from 2007 8 where demands are in crores and uh, today also there is no cert uh, certainty on whether those will be uh, in favor or uh, uh, because there are many cases which can fall under any of uh, the category because there may not be any judicial precedents available so so there are many interpretation issues there are many genuine cases also mistakes uh, error made and all and we are fighting on the interest and penalty so so uh, those cases one can analyze and take the benefit of this scheme as and when it, uh, it is introduced also all the benefits of the itc extension for the up to uh, 21 if there are similar cases pending uh, maybe we can take the benefit of this so with that i'll conclude my session thank you thank you sir uh, for enlightening us on the indirect tax proposals in the budget i now request timothy palavi paul technical director at vs rand co llp for to take session on finance and economic prospect in the budget so uh, good evening everybody uh, uh, the fact is that uh, when i was supposed to end i'm starting so keeping that in mind i will not uh, Uh, extend my uh, session too long uh, so because again the session i am taking care of uh, has been addressed by most of the speakers in the earlier part uh, and also um, the previous two sessions were very uh, specific uh, to sectors with directions but uh, since uh, i am talking about budget and given my background is economics so we work on numbers assumptions and there's nothing right or wrong so these are all interpretation based so having said that uh, what i have done here is i don't have any directions or i don't have any conclusions in my presentation what i have is certain interpretations and those are all mine it should not be uh, uh, i think this is a disclaimer i should put here that it has nothing to do with the organization i'm representing out here uh since it's economics and it is interpretation based me a student of economics has put in my interpretation and um, uh, the way i have addressed is i have put 
questions than interpretations, I would say. Um, so, uh, firstly, um, I, I've started with uh, the economic survey, which came two days back. And, uh, well, I think most of us here would agree that it was a very optimistic-looking economic survey, which it should be, because it's talking about giving a mood to our uh, economy. And uh, having said that, so here we are talking of, uh, say, a growth where we are talking of uh, um, rate of 8.2 percent where i think everywhere we were um, the projection was it would be around seven percent so this is very upbeat and uh, we are uh, projecting a seven percent growth uh, foreign exchange reserves are all-time high in some um, terms in june 2024 we had around 685 billion which is a happy thing uh, tax collected is again very high at 13.4 percent increase, YOY, uh, stock market capitalization hits a five trillion mark, and um, at infrastructure development, the capex increased by 113.5 billion, and core inflation is at a four-year low at 4.3 percent. So, economic survey has been really upbeat, and even if you see the uh, very interestingly, the chapter headings are also very very positive and very different. Uh, now, uh, yes, being optimistic is good, but then there could be a caution. And I think that is what I have addressed uh, a bit out here. So if you see, um, uh, the first takeaway that is uh, we have been talking about is a resilient economy. And uh, yes, we have been. And our projection of 7% is really, really um, something that we should be looking forward to because we are targeting to be the third uh, economy in terms of ranking by 2027. We are right now at around being fifth in the number. But uh, this resilient economy projection uh, depends on what in economics we say saturated paribus. That means all things remaining the same. But we, do, we know that, you know, in the past few years, we have seen so many kinds of externalities that um, we have to be cautious. And uh, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm predicting any doomsday or anything. But yes, the projection that we, that we talk about, and if we are making our own projections basis that, we should take it uh, with a caution. We should have certain assumptions around it. And I think the way we do in economics, we should have an aggressive as well as a conservative projection, which when we are trying to take our economic growth and uh, extrapolating to whatever we are doing. Then coming to stable banking sector. Oh, okay, uh, robust forex reserves. Again, we saw that forex reserves are all time high. But at the same time, I think what was knocking at the back of my head is that in recent term, uh, I think um, a month ago or two months ago, uh, it was newspaper head headline that, you know, we've paid uh, Exim Bank um, some 9,000 crore as bad debt because uh, we had given loans to uh, other economies and those have been written off. So, well, we should take that into account. Uh, next, coming to uh, stable banking sector. Of course, we have a a uh, huge uh, credit going out. The NPAs are at its lowest. But then at the same time, uh, as uh, Madhavi just mentioned, that two-thirds of our economy, uh, personal income taxes have moved to a new regime. What does that mean? Which is very good. But at the same time, there was this huge population which was doing forced savings. And that forced saving is gone. So right now, if you hear, uh, the RBI uh, has been constantly talking about savings not keeping up to the credit. So again, caught them to the wind. Um, next, we are talking of core inflation. We have been harping on it. But core inflation is not what our focus should be. Because the, when we calculate inflation, the majority is actually, I think 44% is food and the rest is well, only a small part is core. And food inflation in June 2024 was hitting 9%. So where are we in inflation? Let's do a corrective. Uh, I won't say corrective. I would say that when we are seeing the inflation number, let's be realistic. 
let's not be too optimistic about it because it hits us every day. Next, coming to the growth strategy for new India. Yes, um, we have lots of things being discussed, lots of, lots of incentives being made, but I think there are two core things that we should uh, be looking at. One is, um, yes, we have a huge space of employable people, but are they really employable? That's one question we should ask ourselves. Yes, there is an interesting thing that is happening uh, that has been suggested in the budget about, you know, the skill um, and, uh, you know, requirement gap being addressed to, you know, introducing new courses, which is very good, which should be done. At the same time, uh, the core basic education that has become a business now needs to be addressed. Is it really business? Are we really looking at education as a business or are we looking at education as a medium to make our new generation employable? Because we've been harping on our population dividend. We are the only nation which can harp about that. Every other country, including China, you know, China is now faltering because of its one kid policy. They are in bad shape. So we are the only country who has a dividend, population dividend we can talk about, but let us make them or let us uh, equip them to be able to take up or rather, you know, reflect the resilient economy we are talking about. Um, FDI uh, inflows, uh, yes, they are being a little slow, but yes, ease of doing business is being, um, I think, a mandate in our budget, which should be um, looked into and questioned and facilitated uh, growing energy needs. Unfortunately, uh, of course, we are, um, uh, you know, manufacturing is make in India is one agenda and energy is a direct consequence or requirement. Now, when we are talking of energy, unfortunately, you know, I left energy sector, which is my PhD has been in energy sector and that I did ages ago around early 2000 and um, then also we were talking of thermal power and today also we are talking of thermal power and um, so uh, and at the same time we are talking of a net zero kind of a uh, situation how are we balancing that that is something we need to take into account and uh, yes are we energy uh, secured is something we need to question and sectoral performance, of course. Uh, manufacturing has been really um, upbeat, uh, and there are incentives for it. Um, services have been good, uh, but agri, agri has been low. Uh, is it something to worry? Of course, it is something to worry because, uh, unfortunately, um, a farmer, a CA's uh, kid becomes a CA. Uh, MBA's kid becomes an MBA, doctor's kid becomes a doctor, but a farmer's kid never becomes a farmer. But we need food on our table. And the food doesn't come from grocery stores. It comes from the farms. Who's doing farming now? We need to really incentivize in a way that actually farming is done. So basis this, I have put in certain thoughts out there. Um, so we, uh, when we say resilient economy, we are talking of a lot of assumptions in terms of we have a food security. You know, we, we think of, you know, we are secured about food. Most of our exports are being restricted, which earlier we used to export a lot of, say, grains, rice, wheat, which has been restricted. But we still have food inflation. This is a thought for you all. Uh, I think we should question, and I see a lot of youngsters, you should start writing papers on it, research it, and, you know, uh, talk about it. Uh, energy security, which I just mentioned, yes, which is, again, important, because we are talking of a manufacturing sector, we are talking of services sector. All of them are energy guzzlers. And, uh, yes, there are incentives happening, but at the same time, are we really secure? And if we are tar trying to target a net zero, then that means we are talking of renewable kind of energy, a focus on that. But even now we have a 800 megawatt supercritical uh, thermal station we are talking about right now. And the other nuclear, solar are much smaller. 
getting them to the grid, bringing about a stability in the grid. These are questions we need to actually answer before we talk of energy security. Um, digital, digital security, yes. India is way ahead in digital. Uh, so today I, I travel a lot and I just need my phone. I, it has everything in it. I don't need anything but a phone. So that's how digital we are. But are we secure? Um, the recent uh, travel, that fiasco that happened. So yes, so cyber security is something we should focus on. Again, a thought. Next is population dividend that we talked about. Yes, education and skill gap needs to be uh, looked into. But besides that, uh, we have older population, which is increasing. Um, one thing to note here, and a thought again, is that our um, pension fund and insurance fund as a percentage of GDP is in single digit and very low. And for most advanced nations, it is actually double digit and way up on double digit. So that is one area which I think, yes, there are been incentives been given in this uh, budget, but that needs a focus. And uh, some more thoughts? Yes. Yeah, actually, that. Uh, absolutely. So basically, I was linking it to my energy security. The environmental uh, security is something that we have been talking about, but uh, maybe um, so that is something, another thing close to my heart. I work in something called ESG tax, where uh, we were just talking about, I think, in the uh, previous part where we said that, yes, tax is what uh, brings us uh, all the revenue that is needed for my social purposes, all that capital outlays that are going out, all the outlays are through my taxation. So there is um, an initiative because nowadays we don't do uh, returns which are, so listed companies nowadays don't do annual uh, reports. They do integrated reports where they are talking of not only their annual uh, financial uh, reporting, but they do sustainability reporting. And in sustainability reporting, um, they have only one guideline, which is called the GRI guideline, GRI 207. And very interestingly, GRI 207 in 2019 got uh, tax as tax reporting or uh, tax transparency as a component. Now, this is all voluntary right now, but it is something which is important because uh, that is, again, in some ways, bringing the environment in the sense right now it is only focusing on um, i would say extractive industries because they are taking away a lot of things or polluting industry so how much are they putting back in taxes to make it more green more energy uh, efficient these are things that needs to be reported and be more transparent about but of course at the same time again caution to the wind uh, we have a lot of green watching green watching in the sense over-reporting of things, which is not what we are actually doing. So there is, again, lots to be done in that. Uh, next is basically what uh, I have put in is things that have been focused and certain thoughts again there. So infrastructure, we've talked about in the budget being strengthened. There are 11 industrial corridors, port enhancements, Agarmela. Then there's railway, public-private partnership. So all very good news. But yes, two things that, again, a thought to be put in there is uh, all the budget that is going and that has happened, uh, who is tracking that? What is the implementation level? There are a lot of stories, actual ground level stories that one might want to relook and reaffirm um, that is it actually getting strengthened? Uh, for example, the public-private pa partnership in railways. Yes, it's a very good initiative. But um, we've done away with railway budget. So now privatization, how is it? Is it really helping? Again, there needs to be assessment. There needs to be, I think, more awareness and documentation or, you know, all of us. We are citizens who, are, who needs to question and ask what is happening. So that, as far as infrastructure strengthening is concerned, um, digitalization is enhanced. Again, there we had the security issue. 
sectoral incentivization again uh, things are happening but uh, very interestingly there has been lot of incentives being uh, discussed in agro sector but um, again msp is a big big question mark what is exactly happening there and the last mile is again a big question because yes where there is a lot of focus this time on you know warehousing and supply to the last mile but uh, again implementation is something we need to really focus on skilling and employability yes again there were a lot of uh, uh, talk about it it is again we go down to because skilling is something that has been a focus there have been lot of um, i think chamber of commerce have been uh, uh, i would say uh you used for these skilling activities um but these funds are readily available can be used but what is the level of skilling that is happening is something that needs to be reviewed so these are the some thoughts i i don't think i will uh, go to the next because everybody's addressed everything uh, the only thing that i would want to say is that uh for um, i think this region the msme uh, incentives which uh, have been in the form of skill development uh support support to msmes in terms of loans and financing these are being facilitated that can be used uh besides that uh, as uh, indirect taxes uh, mentioned about certain customs which has uh, sort of um been uh, facilitated been withdrawn like say lithium or solar panels these are you know msme sector which should focus on also agro based sectors again fish feed and things like that are areas that um, has uh, received a lot of incentives are areas which where one can work in the other i think um, a very focused uh, area in oh, okay the other is obviously the employment linked incentive uh, i would say schemes which are uh, trying to mobilize uh, the msme sector or, or incentivize the msme sector i would not go to not go into the details because it's all available there and of course for pharma the biggest is uh, all the incentives or the uh, i would say concessional customs duties of which has been extended pli schemes that have been extended and pharma is a big in this region is something that uh, telangana can actually focus on and look for a growth so with that i think i will end the session so oh, thank you ma'am thank you very much for the enlightening us on economic and Financing prospect on the budget. Uh, and I now request uh, Rahul Singhani sir to join on the day. And when we are going to begin, I will start Q and A Q and A session. Uh, Ma'am, thanks very much for a very uh, very on the dot kind of presentation. I I am a professor, and the the, the budget spoke laid a lot of emphasis on skill development, but. We've been talking about it for the past 25 years at least. The National Skill Development Corporation is actually meant for some of these activities, for skilling activities. In fact, I had the opportunity of meeting Mr. Dharmendra Prasad about five years ago at the India Habitat Center in New Delhi. But uh, this is not a question; just an observation yeah. that we talk about demographic dividend quite a lot. We have, uh, as we speak, 65 percent of India's population is under the age of 35. 75 crore Indians are under the age of uh, uh, 35. Uh, we will see, see if we don't address this problem in the next 30, 40 years, the curve will go down. By 2059, it will go down, and we will face the problem that Japan is facing today. Japan is such an old economy today that it is condescendingly called the adult diaper nation, right? It's a, it's a. So, so, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm not as optimistic because I work in the education field. Maybe I'm not. Uh, we need a, an outside perspective as to how we will build this big. big cat right i i i don't know i mean i absolutely agree so you know identifying the gap is good uh you know curating courses is good but i think every uh and one thing on addition the one quick point again is look at the trajectory of china's development over the past 30 years since 1980 40 years they have, they have had a manufacturing sector led growth yes So when we talk about adopting the Chinese model, we have to understand that best practice will not work. We need to look, look at the next practice. 
it says we are moving towards a regime, a, a technology regime where AI is going to take a lot of these jobs away. See, I think uh, just focusing on that's why I, mom, I also emphasized on agro. Agri sector is something that because we were an agriculture economy, we cannot deny that. You know, so the balance is something we need to strike. So, and of course, you know, the education has become a business which now needs to sort of, you know, balance out. Madam, he was, he was talking about skills and employability. I'm a trainer trained more than four lakh people in India and other countries. But nobody gives importance to training, madam. I'm sorry to tell you. He, whatever Modi says, he's telling about the manufacturing uh, skills. But soft skills, many skills are there. If you, if you, skills are like a language. If, if you would like to develop, you should have skills. But neglected. Uh, one thing, they have to take care of it. Number two, employability. I've seen recently in, the, in, a, in a presentation that some industries say that there is no un 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 unemployment in India. Because why people are only looking for government jobs. People are not looking for private jobs. No, no. Today I met one of my friends. He's not even a line man. He's getting 90,000 rupees pension. 90,000 rupees pension, a line man. So that also has to be uh, addressed. You, know, you can do like other, other countries, you know, senior citizen uh, fund, something like that. But both things have to be addressed, madam. Thank you. Actually, coming to uh, employability, so there are MSMEs who are not getting people to work. That is also there because, you know, there are these grants, subsidies, uh, food uh, being given, provided. So they, you are making, you know, employable people, uh, you know, absolutely laid back because they don't, they, they're getting everything served on the plate. They don't need to work. Even unless they can't afford them. <laughs> they can't afford them. Absolutely. So nobody wants to become an agriculturist. Which is, which has, it's, uh, I think uh, the other side of it is, if you see, because of mechanization, so you need uh, the first soil, the, just below the soil, whatever microorganisms they are, are very important for your agriculture. But because of mechanization, that has been killed. So that is again, has its uh, cons, if I may say so. But, um, uh, my macroeconomics is a big subject. I think I don't have any qualification to talk, but I do agriculture also. Fantastic. We should all yeah. try and take... Uh, My predicament is, I sell 100 coconuts and buy one coffee. So th that's what we were talking about. No, when you say is, MSP yeah. and pricing and all... No, no, no. This is because, madam, the national planning, we are not bothered about diesel prices. We are increasing left and right. Number two, for political reasons, we are increasing the wages. So these two are the killers for agriculture. So I have a coconut up on the tree, available for four rupees. When it comes down, it becomes six rupees. Because the person who is going up to pluck it, he's charging one rupee. The person who will collect it and put it in transport is another rupee. Then transportation is two rupees to the town. And the labor who is doing coconut water selling, he has to, no, no, he has to collect maybe 8,000 rupees is his salary, wage. So if he is selling 100, 10 rupees is his fees. So 4 rupees is the cost of rearing or bringing out a coconut. And it is available in the market for 40 rupees. This is fully because of wages and transport cost, nothing else. So the, if we want to develop the nation in the long run, these factors should come down as a percentage of cost of agriculture. But I have another question for Venu Madhavini. So what happens uh, if the development agreement happens day before yesterday? So we, in long term LTCG, if the development agreement happens yesterday, a day before yesterday, uh, we follow the old regime or new regime? It will be the old one only, sir. 
with yeah. effect from twenty third only. Okay, number one. Number two, in respect of individuals and HCF, the incidence of LT LTCG and this on the date of sale of the first unit, hmm. which section. So that holds good like that. Yeah, it still holds good. There is no change in that section. Okay, hmm. thank you. Madam, thank you very much for your presentation, Madam. Particularly, Kavita, Madam. I, madam, one uh, follow me, Madam. One question to you is that one uh, that comes under the technology. We talked about the technology, you know, but everything has been changing, no? Environment changing and the climate change is coming up the hottest topic. Technology is also changing simultaneously every day. But in this present situation, the technology is changing. Do I expect my data will be the privacy in the, that is strong and effectively? That is the cyber security. No, no. Type of Whatever data. the type of the data in my yeah. stored in my mobile, how can I expect that one in the present situation? You, it is your opinion for this. Yeah, that's what I said. You couldn't fly. So, but the interesting part is uh, a friend of mine is working closely on uh, the Diyatra. So he is uh, instrumental in it. And when I said that, oh, you know, it has made my life very easy. So his first question to me was, you are on DG Yatra? You're not scared? I said, you are the one who worked on it and you're asking me, I'm not scared? So, yes, it is still uh, something that is work in progress. Uh, I'm sure, but unfortunately, you know, as technology improves, uh, there are other people who are trying to find loopholes. They are also advancing at equal space, if not more. So it's still open to, uh, I should say, uh, discussion. Uh, I think one saving place from yesterday comes uh, to uh, I got 20 CG and 50 CG is that yeah. the market having tanked, having tanked very badly. Yesterday, we were 1,400 points down, recovered. Today, again, down and recovered. Maybe the Indian capital markets have matured. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. But this, this, this onset of maturity hopefully will not, uh, will not uh, motivate the government to increase the taxes next year. But the downside of capital markets uh, improving is my uh, savings will not Any further questions of that? So how that is going to affect? So basically, no. So banks. No, that is not. So banks are giving out credit. So they don't. If they don't have the savings and credit ratio, have no, to give to banks. Banks, we are directly. So there are certain uh, credits which has to happen to yeah. banks. You are not giving it to everybody. Who are investing directly in some of these But there are smaller uh, people who need credit, no, no, which no, is no, happening to banks. We are paying more percent. Whereas the interest rates are getting some So bank is in That is another thing they should look into. Yes. There is no yeah. problem. So, madam, uh, sir. We, we, life of a senior citizen is <laughs> happening. How much we are getting for the bank FDR? Some banks are giving 8%. It's very difficult to live in this. In, 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 in this days, with the money, uh, 20 years ago, that, that was good. But today it's not good. Government should think about the senior citizens also. Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, uh, please. Welcome, welcome, sir. Point well taken, sir. Thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. I now request uh, Rahul Singhani Agar and Chief uh, to present moment of store speaker. Uh, first, Venuma, Srimati Venu Madhavi.
Thank you. I know the first uh, speaker, Mulai Garu, to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, Rahul Singhania and uh, other speakers on the dais and the chair for both the direct and indirect taxes and delegates who have the patience to sit until the very end, uh, including the officials from the income tax department, uh, including the principal uh, commissioner. Tanda uh, Srinivasgaru, who are there till the very end. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, excellent presentation by both the speakers. Uh, and uh, they have gone into uh, the uh, detail uh, which was required. Uh, and of course, on the Economic economic analysis uh, side. Uh, I think it ended the whole process uh, of uh, uh, specific technical issues in a very broader note and uh, some takeaways as to what we need to think about. And we thank uh, uh, Mr. Paul for the uh, for the excellent presentation on that. And uh, we will, of course, make some representations that we have noted down, both from the direct tax side, where specific questions of the Federation were uh, uh, clarified and the information, further information sought, and um, on the indirect tax uh, portion as to what we need to address uh, on the aspect of the amnesty schemes, which is the most immediate uh, uh, homework which all of us should do so that we don't miss the bus once again, uh, either by getting some other bus and losing this bus or, or getting into the wrong bus. Uh, yes. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for uh, for making this event a very grand success. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request all to join for hiking. Yeah.